Secretary Kathleen Sebelius testified Thursday before a House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee on her department's 2012 budget request and the implementation of the health care law. The health care legislation was signed into law by the President in March 2010. On Monday, President Obama told the nation's governors that he's willing to give states an opportunity to opt out of certain requirements of the health care law by 2014 rather than 2017 if they could find their own ways to accomplish its goals. This hearing is two hours and 40 minutes. Witness today, and so that every member of this subcommittee may have time to answer questions. We'll be strict in enforcing our time limits today. That's uh, five minutes for questioning, and that's questioning and answers. So don't ask a five-minute question and then ask the secretary to then try to respond in the remaining seconds. And we've agreed to three-minute opening statements. The chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. It's three minutes. <clears throat> I would like to welcome our distinguished witness today, the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Madam Secretary, thank you for your time and your testimony today. The Department of Health and Human Services is a large department with broad authority and jurisdiction. With the enactment of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, PIPACA, we have found there are several sections of this new law that require mandatory funding, hence bypassing the normal appropriations process. Today's hearing will give us a chance to examine these provisions and consider the budgetary implications for implementation and administration of this new law. One aspect that I am concerned with is the Office of Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, SIO. Less than a month after PIPACA passed last year, the department moved regulation of health insurance from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where it had been for years, to a new office, SIO, which reports directly to the secretary. Then in January of this year, the Secretary announced that OSIO would be moving and would now be housed at CMS. This is interesting because OSIO implements and regulates many of the new health care's private insurance provisions, and CMS runs the nation's public health programs. The office has been in the news lately for granting over 900 waivers to private health plans unable to meet various standards set by uh, Obamacare. It is important to note that the OSIO was not authorized nor even mentioned in Obamacare, yet the President's budget request includes a $1 billion increase for program management discretionary administration at CMS. It appears that this additional $1 billion will be funding OSIO. I'll be interested in learning more about this new office and the role it plays, and I look forward to seeing more transparency in the Department's budget. And for my remaining time, I yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do welcome the sac Secretary. And I'll pick up right where Mr. Chairman left off with uh, transparency. And I think what is astounding to many is the lack of transparency in this process and the difficulty with getting uh, information. We know that our states have fought the battle. Indeed, not only uh, companies, but states are receiving waivers. Uh, what we see in front of us, Madam Secretary, seems to be a confused process. Our states are frustrated. We've heard from state legislators, from governors. They're all beginning to agree with your former colleague, Governor Bredesen, who called to this the mother of all unfunded mandates, and with others who said, you know, it's too expensive to afford, and this is something that would bankrupt the states. There is just uh, truly... A, <clears throat> A dissatisfaction and uh, one of the things I will highlight with you today and question with you is my concern over lack of response and inadequate response to questions. Yield back. Chair, thanks. Gentlelady and yields uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, and I want to welcome Secretary Sebelius. In these tough economic times, I recognize how difficult budgetary and spending decisions are for the President and this Congress. I commend the President for his responsible budget. I only hope that we can work together to move this country forward, to create jobs, and to foster economic growth. And I want to commend Secretary Sebelius for your agency's hard work this past year to implement the Affordable Care Act. I will continue to fight against the Republican efforts to defund this important landmark law. 
I can't agree more with President Obama that as we continue to work our way out of the recession towards a thriving economy that offers economic opportunities for all Americans, that we must out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. And to do that, I believe the federal government has a vital role to play. At the core of innovation is research and development. It is R&D that propels the science and the business of healthcare. In fact, a recent report showed that healthcare R&D supports 211,000 jobs and $60 billion in economic activity in my state of New Jersey. But R&D requires resources. Investments made by government can help research projects get off the ground and leverage resources off the private sector and academia. And that's why I was very pleased to see that the President's budget includes government investments in healthcare R&D. His budget recognizes that key agencies like NIH and FDA are essential to facilitate an environment where Americans can continue to innovate. I did want to mention, however, my disappointment in one program, that's the termination of the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program. This has reversed declines in pediatric training programs that had threatened the stability of the pediatric workforce and the small class of hospitals that receive this funding, which includes the Children's Specialized Hospital in my district, represent about, represents about 1% of hospitals nationwide, but trains approximately 40% of all pediatricians. Eliminating this program would have a major negative impact on access to primary care and impact access to specialty care for children. But I, and I wanted to mention that I'm committed to reauthorizing and funding this program and bill, introducing a bill to do that soon. But really, I, I wanted to stress, uh, Madam Secretary, that I really do think um, that as we move forward uh, with the Affordable Care Act, I know the anniversary uh, is coming up, um, I believe, on March 23rd, just in a couple of weeks. Um, already, there are so many of my constituents uh, and so many people that I talk to that talk about the benefits of you know, eliminating pre-existing conditions, of being able to put their children on the policies, uh, uh, what we've done for seniors in terms of cutting back on and eventually eliminating the donut hole, uh, eliminating co-pays uh, for preventative care. People are very much aware of the benefits of this, and more and more, I think, as it continues to be implemented, will be. And I am very much opposed to any efforts to defund uh, the program, particularly uh, since we see the positive benefits from it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. And yields uh, three minutes to the chair of the committee, Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two days ago, we heard from the, some of the nation's governors uh, on the negative impact that the new law will have on their states and quality of health care. What we heard is similar to what most members hear anytime they speak with their governor. They express their concern that the mandates and requirements coming out of D.C. are hindering their ability to deal with the state's problems. The President did offer, I think, uh, some flexibility on Monday by declaring that the states could opt out of certain aspects of the health reform law a few years early as long as they met every one of the goals. Well, I'm concerned that the states will only be allowed to take advantage of the so-called flexibility if they construct a program that looks almost exactly like the system that was set up in the health care law. States need real flexibility without all the strings and caveats attached. The President did call on the governors to come up with a bipartisan proposal on Medicaid. Dozens of governors have already asked for relief from maintenance of effort requirements so that they can direct Medicaid funds to those most in need and meet their constitutional responsibility to balance their state budgets. If states are instead in forced to impose steep reductions on payments to providers, They'll likely drive more doctors and other providers out of the Medicaid program and in some cases out of the practice of medicine altogether. I believe that's detrimental to both patients and to the quality of care that they can expect to receive. If the President wants a bipartisan Medicaid proposal, then we need to repeal the maintenance of effort is the place to start and I hope that the administration will work with members of this committee to expeditiously repeal those requirements. I'd also like to hear from the Secretary what programs at HHS she believes are redundant and duplicative. With federal deficits as far as the eye can see, $1.6 trillion in the President's budget for 12, we must go through the budget with a fine tooth comb. As yesterday's report from the GAO revealed at the Subcommittee uh, on Oversight Investigations, the federal government is wasting tens of billions of dollars on duplication, overlap, and fragmented programs. We cannot simply fund programs because what we did last year or the year before. Every program has to be scrutinized, and I look forward to working with you, and I yield the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Cassidy from Louisiana. 
Governor Deval Patrick testified Tuesday that Massachusetts developed the model for Obamacare and that Massachusetts gives a vision of our future. I agree. We were told almost everything else he said, though, was false. We were told that because of this model that ER visits are down. They are not. As it turns out, they're up significantly, according to the Urban Institute, and 20 percent in western Massachusetts. We're told that the private insurance market is unaffected. Actually, fewer businesses are offering insurance and premiums are up above the national average. We were told that a cost is an issue that's being addressed and access is expanding. Actually, according to the Globe and the National Journal, people are being disenrolled and, quote, dental benefits are being slashed to hundreds of thousands threatening their access to their dentist. Indeed, the Democratic state treasurer said, if the United States implements a plan like Massachusetts, we will go bankrupt. Now, the question before us today is whether we believe the vision of which we are told or the vision that we see. I yield back. Chair, thanks. Gentlemen, yields three minutes to the ranking mem uh, chair uh, of the committee, Mr. Waxman. Madam Secretary, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to our committee. First, I want to uh, commend you on the work you're doing to implement the Affordable Care Act. That's the name of the law. The, the job uh, you were given by Congress and the President is imposing, but you've met it with leadership and steadfast commitment. Today's hearing is meant to address the President's budget proposal for HHS for fiscal year 2012. You wouldn't know it from the opening statements. But fiscal year 2012 seems very far away at this point. I'm much more focused on the threats from the continuing resolution passed by the House. I believe the cuts proposed by the Republican budget would be just devastating to the mission of your department. The Republican proposal would cut 23 percent from the Centers for Med Medicare and Medicaid Services. Well, this will devastate the ability of the agency to maintain its basic functions like paying Medicare claims, cracking down on fraud, and funding health programs through Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program. The FDA would see cuts of 17 percent with enforcement of the new food safety law gutted. The Centers for Disease Control would be cut by 37 percent, leaving Americans more exposed to viruses and illnesses. The Community Health Centers Program, which has strong bipartisan support, would be cut by $1 billion, closing 127 health centers and cutting off 11 million patients from care they need. Cuts of this magnitude are not belt tightening or doing more with less. They go to the heart of the core missions of the agencies that comp comprise HHS, jeopardize access to health care, research, and the safety of our food and pharmaceuticals. I agree with President Obama's guidance to us yesterday in discussing a final CR for this fiscal year. This agreement should be bipartisan, it should be free of any party's social or political agenda, and it should be reached without delay. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here today, and I urge you to continue to work diligently to implement the essential protections of the Affordable Care Act. And I'd be pleased to yield to any of my colleagues on the Democratic side. Uh, Mr. Engel, I'll yield to you. Uh, uh, the rest of my time. Yes, I, I want to um, second uh, what Mr. Waxman uh, has uh, just uh, said. Uh, when we look at the uh, Republican budget, uh, we see uh, things cut out that are really just uh, unimaginable. You know, we, we, we heard the governors, and I know, Madam Secretary, you're a former governor, we, we heard uh, the Republican governors come here and basically say they don't like the health care law, uh, they want uh, government to, to get out of people's lives. You know, if, if, if Governor Barber is happy with Mississippi always being 49th and 50th in education and health care, then I suppose he'll be happy with it. But some of us do feel that, that health care, affordable health care, uh, is a right, and that's what we try to do. And the negativity boggles my mind. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. And at this time, we'll go to our witness. I would like to introduce our witness, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Secretary Sebelius was first elected to the Kansas House of Representatives in 1986. In 1994, Secretary, Secretary Sebelius was elected State Insurance Commissioner for the state of Kansas, and in 2002, she was elected to be the state's governor. Madam Secretary, we welcome you to the committee. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone, uh, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the 2012 budget for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in the President's State of the Union address, he outlined his vision for how the United States can win the future by out-educating, out-building, and out-innovating the world so we can give every family and business the chance to thrive. And I think our 2012 budget is a blueprint for putting a portion of that vision into action. It makes investments for the future so that we grow our economy and create jobs. But we also recognize that we can't build lasting prosperity on a mountain of debt. Years of deficits have put us in a position where we need to make tough choices. In order to invest for the future, we need to live within our means. So in developing the budget, we look closely at every program in our department. And when we found waste, we cut it. When programs weren't working well, we re redesigned them to put a new focus on results. And in some cases, we cut programs we wouldn't have cut in better fiscal times. And I look forward to answering your questions, but Mr. Chairman, I'd like to start with just sharing some highlights. Over the last 11 months, we've worked around the clock with our partners in Congress and states to deliver on the promise of the Affordable Care Act. Thanks to the law, children are no longer denied coverage because of their pre-existing health conditions. Families have protections in the new Patients' Bill of Rights. Businesses are getting relief from the soaring health care costs, and seniors have lower cost access to prescription drugs and preventive care. This budget builds on the progress by supporting innovative new models of care that will improve patient safety and quality while reducing the rising burden of health costs on families, businesses, cities, and states. We make new investments in our healthcare workforce and community health centers to make quality, affordable care available to millions more Americans and create hundreds of thousands of new jobs across the country. At the same time, the budget includes additional proposals that strengthen program integrity in Medicare, promote lower medicine costs, improve Medicare program operations, and reform the quality improvement organizations which help providers improve care. The budget also includes saving proposals to strengthen Medicaid. It includes funding for the Transitional Medical Assistance Program and Medicare Part B premium assistance for low-income beneficiaries, programs which help keep health costs down for low-income individuals and help them keep their vital coverage. To make sure America continues to lead the world in innovation, our budget includes funding increases for the National Institutes of Health. New frontiers of research like cell-based therapies and genomics have the promise to unlock transformative treatments and cures for diseases ranging from Alzheimer's to cancer to autism. And our budget will allow the world's leading scientists to continue to pursue discoveries while keeping America at the forefront of biomedical research. And because we know there's nothing more important to our future than the healthy development of our children, our budget includes significant increases in funding for child care and Head Start. Science shows that success in school is significantly enhanced by high quality early learning opportunities. These investments are some of the wisest that we can make in our future. But our budget does more than provide additional resources. It also aims to raise the bar on quality in child care programs, supporting key reforms to transform the nation's child care system into one that fosters healthy development and gets children ready for school. It proposes a new Early Learning Challenge Fund, a partnership with the Department of Education that promotes state innovation in early education. And these initiatives, combined with the quality efforts already underway in Head Start, are an important part of the President's education agenda to help every child reach his or her academic potential and make our nation more competitive. The budget also promotes strong family relationships, it supports a child support and fatherhood initiative that encourages fathers to take responsibility for their children, changes policies so that more of that support reaches the children, and maintains a commitment to vigorous enforcement, promoting healthy relationships between fathers and their children. We also fund new performance-driven incentives for states to improve outcomes for children in foster care, such as reducing long-term foster stays and the reoccurrence of child maltreatment. These children also need to be part of our better future. 
Our budget recognizes that at a time when so many Americans are making every dollar count, we need to do the same. That's why the budget provides new support for President Obama's unprecedented push to stamp out waste, fraud, and abuse in our health care system, an effort that more than pays for itself, returning a record of $4 billion to taxpayers last year alone. In addition, the budget includes a robust package of administrative improvements for Medicare and Medicaid. The proposals include prepayment scrutiny, expanded auditing, increased penalties for improper actions, and strengthen CMS's ability to implement corrective actions and address state activities that increase federal spending. Over 10 years, on a conservative estimate, they should deliver over $32 billion in savings. Across our department, we've made eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse a top priority, but we know that isn't enough. So over the last few months, we've also gone through the department's budget program by program to find additional savings and opportunities where we can make our resources go further. In 2009, Congress created a grant program to help states expand health care coverage, and we've eliminated that program because it's duplicative. CDC funding has been helping states reduce chronic diseases, but the funding was split between different diseases, one grant for heart disease, another for diabetes. We thought it didn't make sense, since a lot of those conditions have the same risk factors like obesity and smoking. And now states will get one comprehensive grant that allows them more flexibility to address chronic disease in their home territories more effectively. The 2012 budget we're releasing today makes tough choices and smart, targeted investments today so we have a stronger, healthy, and more competitive America tomorrow. That's what it will take to win the future, and that's what we're determined to do. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering your questions. Chair thanks the uh, gentlelady and uh, recognizes himself for uh, five minutes for questions. Uh, Madam Secretary, Section 4002 of PIPACA creates, created a fund to provide funding for programs authorized by the Public Health Service Act for prevention, wellness, and public health activities. From the period fiscal year 12 to fiscal year 21, there will be $17.75 billion deposited in the fund. My question is, who has the authority to determine how these funds are spent? Mr. Chairman, um, our department, in consultation uh, with Congress, uh, we presents a spending plan for the prevention fund a year at a time. Um, follow up on that. Are you authorized to spend this money without any further congressional action? Yes, we are. Are you authorized to add funds to a program above and beyond what Congress appropriated for that program in a given year? Yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, like most states nationally, my state is struggling with a major projected shortfall in its coming budget. The maintenance of effort provision in PAPACA for the Medicaid program is removing a major lever for them to consider as they try to balance the budget. Can you give me a yes or no answer as to whether there will be an opportunity uh, to waive that provision to help Pennsylvania and other states close their budget holes? Mr. Chairman, that question doesn't lend itself to yes or no. We are um have the ability to grant 1115 waivers to states that improve the Medicaid program. And we're working very actively with governors across the country. I've met with all the new governors. We've been in 19 states so far. We are working a budget at a time to look at the flexibility uh, that governors are requesting. Uh, given that the Supreme Court will be looking at this new law in the coming months or years, we as a Congress have to prepare for the possibility that a portion of PIPACA might be invalidated while other parts remain. If the individual mandate were set aside and the remaining portions of the bill were left intact, what would be the impact in the total number of uninsured? And assuming that number would grow, would the administration seek to find a new way to cover these folks through Medicaid? Well, Mr. Chairman, we're confident that the 
personal responsibility portion uh, will be upheld. There are 12 judges who have dismissed cases so far, uh, three federal judges, including one as recently as last week, who have held the entire law constitutional, one judge in Virginia who found a portion, the individual responsibility portion, unconstitutional, but uh, declared it severable and uh, refused to grant an injunction, and a Florida judge who has ruled another way. So our team is confident at the end of the day that the law will be held constitutional. Um, we are looking at um, a variety of options, and those were examined as the Affordable Care Act was being considered about the best way. If you eliminate pre-existing conditions to make sure that you have a stable and secure insurance pool, as you know, the personal responsibility section actually came from the insurance industry, from the American Association of Health Insurance Plans, who felt that the way to have a solvent pool uh, in an insurance market is to um, make sure that you can balance the risk. And that proposal really comes from uh, the insurance industry. If you could give me a yes or no, will you approve a Medicaid block grant program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there isn't a block grant program that is being suggested at this point, but I know that there is some interest in that. I can't tell you what the parameters might be. I think a block grant has the real danger of shifting enormous burdens onto already strapped states. Thank you. I'll yield the balance of my time to Dr. Cassidy. Thank you, Ms. Secretary. Um, one of my concerns is how the state Medicaid budgets are going to be supplemented. Mr. Waxman the other day spoke about currently there appear to be discrepancies how much a state should get and how much they do get. Frankly, his state, California, suffers under this. It's important because Jonathan Gruber, I think one of your consultants, published an article that says in his state about 1.7 million people will be added to Medicaid so under this plan, so it's going to stress it further. Do you see concerns with how the current FMAP, SMAP is constructed, equity issues regarding states. I say that because Vermont, although a lower FMAP, gets about $7,500 per beneficiary, and Mississippi gets, with a higher FMAP, about $3,000 per beneficiary. Any thoughts about that? Well, I know there are constant concerns about the formula that um, is the allocation formula for FMAP. Mississippi actually has the highest match rate of any state. But they only get $3,000 from the federal government. So they have an 83% FMAP, but they only get $3,000 per beneficiary. I, I, and I won't dispute that. I don't know the numbers. I do know they have the highest FMAP rate in the country. Um, I think that there is a constant analysis of changing demographics, changing populations. I know in your state of Louisiana, it became an issue after uh, Katrina in New Orleans and the changing demographics of uh, that city changed dramatically their share of the federal budget. So there have been concerns over the past and we would work with Congress to look at updating the FMAP on a, on a regular basis. My time has expired. Uh, yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Blum. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would mention to you that if you would entertain the possibility of, of uh, upping FMAP or doing more with FMAP, I'd be glad to oblige, just so you had any doubt about uh, where I stand on that issue. We'd be more than willing to do another FMAP bill and increase the FMAP funding. Um, I wanted to ask about innovation, Madam Secretary. America's competitiveness depends on our ability to innovate and keep America number one, but instead the Republicans included over a billion dollars in cuts to NIH and over 240 million to the Food and Drug Administration in their 2011 CR. And I believe this represents a significant setback because key agencies like NIH and FDA are essential to facilitating an environment where Americans can continue to innovate. For instance, at a medical device hearing last week, we heard about CDRH's newly announced medical device innovation initiative, and this is a new voluntary priority review program by FDA for new breakthrough medical devices to help innovator companies bring their products to market. But in the cuts, uh, if the cuts in the Republican CR are enacted, FDA did not think they would have the funds to implement this initiative. And this is just an example of the dangerous impacts we would see if FDA's budget is cut by over $240 million. So Madam Secretary, I believe a cut of 17% will slow the approvals for devices, drugs, and other innovative products. Uh, isn't that correct? I mean, isn't that what we're going to face with the FDA if this CR becomes law? Well, I think, um, Congressman, uh, the President uh, shares your belief that 
investments in both the Food and Drug Administration and in the National Institutes of Health are wise and strategic investments uh, for the safety and security of our uh, food supply and our uh, acceleration of, of devices and drugs getting to the market and to keep America at the forefront of the biomedical industry, which we have been for decades. Um, so he has made uh, recommendations about uh, investments, uh, enhancements to both the National Institutes of Health budget and for the Food and Drug Administration and believe strongly that that's really keeping a commitment with the, not only the American public, but growing jobs in the economy uh, that we desperately need uh, and that the failure to fund those agencies um, to the full extent both jeopardize some of the important responsibilities they have as well as threaten, I think the last detail I saw from Dr. Collins at NIH is that for every dollar in research grants, seven dollars is generated in a local community so that it has an enormous ripple effect when research grants are put out in university communities across this country as well as the life-saving cure possibility that results. And I mean the same is true. I mean the CR with, with the NIH, the CRO, CR proposes over a billion dollars in cuts to the NIH budget. Uh, for innovation, this year is worse. It appears the majority of the cuts will come out of the small percent of the budget for new NIH grants, about $640 million from the budget of $3.9 billion. That would mean thousands of fewer NIH awards this year. Again, I mean, the cut to the NIH would be devastating on the cutting-edge research into new cures and treatments for diseases. If you just comment on that briefly, because then I do want to ask about the children's graduate medical education. Well, as you know, um Congressman, the NIH budget had a dramatic um, increase in funding thanks to um, the investment in the Recovery Act, feeling that scientific investment was um, a major innovation um, effort for the United States. So they are already struggling with um, that grant funding, which is coming to an end. And I can tell you it will have a very chilling impact on research grants. Uh, across this country if indeed the NIH budget is not adequately funded in 2012. Um, All right, let me ask you this about the children's graduate medical education because the president's budget zeroed that out. In my home state of New Jersey, we have the highest rate of autism in the country, one in 94 children. In my district, uh, Children's Specialized Hospital provides services to children with disabilities and clinical services to like 4,000 kids. Um, my concern is that um, you know, we, we have very few uh, subspecialties in pediatrics right now, and in the budget, the president's budget, it basically justifies zeroing it out by saying that they want to focus on primary care. But we actually need more subspecialists, not, you know, more so by every, you know, uh, physician's group. So how, how do you justify that? I mean, it seems to not make sense to me. Well, I would say, Mr. Chairman, I, um, your concern about this program, um, we have heard uh, from a number of people, and I can assure you in any different budget time, um, this would not have been one of the recommendations. The uh, goal was to try and focus as many GME dollars as possible into the workforce for uh, primary care gerontology and to put it into the programs where the vast majority is training primary care doctors, but this trade-off is very difficult. All right. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Chairman, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to just start off uh, initially by following up on a question that you asked uh, and uh, regarding the maintenance of effort. Now, the President said earlier this week that if the states could present a bipartisan proposal on Medicaid that he would like to support it. <clears throat> and if there is broad bipartisan support to repeal the maintenance of effort, now, would that be something that you'd like to work with us on to, to see it happen? Well, the President has directed me, um, Chairman Upton, to work with the governors uh, around this proposal, so I'll be very actively involved, and, and he is eager to see their, their ideas. I think what um, we are eager to do and have uh, pointed out to a number of governors is the, the focus of the, a lot of the cost drivers is the so-called dual eligible, um, which is why um, at... Uh, Congress, uh, 
was wise enough to include a new office of dual eligibles as part of the Affordable Care Act structure. It's about 15% um, of the population of Medicaid beneficiaries and over uh, close to 40% of the cost nationwide. So we are really eager to work on those issues. Now, I know that the pre this happened all earlier this week, so there's not been a lot of time, but have you identified uh, a subset of Republican and, and Democratic uh, governors uh, that will be the lead that you're going to work with yet? I, that is not... Um, Believe me, I'm, I'm very deferential to my former colleagues. You. The National Governors Association, uh, Governor Gregoire chairs it, and Governor Heineman from Nebraska is the vice chair this year. They've been asked to put together a governor's group. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, in your testimony, you discussed the state-based health insurance exchanges uh, that were created by the new law. As noted in your budget, you are provided a mandatory appropriation uh, not simply an authorization of such sums as necessary to issue grants to states. Uh, is there any monetary limitations to the grant making authority? Uh, no, sir. The, uh, uh, with the exception that the exchanges have a series of legal parameters uh, that have to be met in order to draw down funds. Uh, under Section 1311H, uh, it authorizes your department to force doctors, hospitals, and other providers to meet new quality requirements or face expulsion from contracting with any qualified health plans offered in the exchange. Has HHS started to, to draft any regulations uh, yet on that, those provisions Mr. that you're aware of? Mr. Chairman, I, I am not aware of any mandatory provider provisions um, or expulsion. I will, I will be glad to answer that question in writing. I don't, I'm not familiar with the section that you're speaking okay. of off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, before the House Budget Committee two weeks ago, I want to say, uh, Richard Foster, uh, CMS, was asked about two of the main claims that the supporters of uh, PPAC uh, uh, talked about. First, he was asked about whether the claim that the law would hold down costs, whether it was true or false. He said false, more so than true. Uh, and second, he was asked whether Americans, uh, whether they could keep their health care plans uh, if they liked them. Uh, and he indicated that it was not true in all cases. So those are his words. Uh, do you agree or disagree with some of the things that he said? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've read uh, Mr. Foster's testimony, and I think that what he has um, indicated is that he does not feel it is likely that Congress followed the outlines of the law. Um, I, if indeed the law is changed, uh, there will be a different result. We believe the Congressional Budget Office analysis that uh, which was updated just, I think, 10 days ago, that $230 billion would be saved over the next 10 years and a trillion dollars over the uh, two decades is an accurate assessment. If indeed the law has changed, there needs to be a different assessment. Last question I, I have is uh, regarding the, the grandfather status uh, uh, on the health care plans. Uh, by some estimates, uh, provided in your department's rule, anywhere between 87 million and 117 million Americans will not be able to keep their health care plan. Does the administration continue to claim that the health care law will, in fact, allow their plan, uh, allow Americans to keep their plan if they like it? Mr. Chairman, the, um, the law is built around the private insurance market, and as you know, employers voluntarily enter that market. Um, and make decisions a year at a time on plan design, on provider issues, on network issues. Um, the grandfather clause is designed to uh, make sure that as much as possible, without shifting major financial burdens onto consumers or dramatically changing benefits, that plans can indeed um, keep exactly the, the plan moving forward, making adjustments in premiums as they go along, but nothing precludes what has been part of a dynamic market in the private sector all along, which is that employers choose uh, year in and year out, uh, moving in and out of a marketplace. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, 
chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm deeply concerned about the cuts proposed by the Republicans for the remaining seven months of this fiscal year and their continuing resolution, H.R. 1. I have a letter, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert by, in the record by unanimous consent from the Social Security Administration to its employees. Without objection, so ordered. This uh, letter states that the Social Security Administration may have to initiate furloughs if the budget cuts being considered by the House become law. Why would that matter to Medicare, Madam Secretary? That the Social Security Administration... Right. Well, the Social Security Administration processes the new enrollments into Medicare. Uh, furloughs at the Social Security oh. Administration would lead to backlogs and processing new enrollment and gaps in coverage for nearly half a million new Medicare beneficiaries. So uh, uh, that, that uh, should be of concern, not just for Social Security, but for the Medicare program. Well, and Mr. Waxman, as you know, this year the first of the baby boomers became Medicare eligible, so we are seeing an expanded uh, Medicare beneficiary class uh, this year and every year um, of the immediate future. So enrolling people in a timely and accurate fashion is, is hugely important. So that would really bop the baby boomers who are becoming... 20 I have an anal analysis from the Democratic staff that I'd like to ask you, uh, for unanimous consent to insert into the record. Without objection, so ordered. This memo documents the size of the cuts proposed by the Republicans. Some of these numbers are just shocking for programs overseen by your committee. Republicans propose to reduce funding for, funding for CMS, the agency that runs the Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program by 23% once you consider the fact that the year is almost halfway finished. This is not a little haircut or a matter of finding some efficiencies. That kind of a cut could prevent CMS from performing its core duties, paying for the health care needs of seniors, persons with disabilities, mothers, and kids in Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. Madam Secretary, would you be concerned about the impact on Medicare beneficiaries of a proposed 23% cut combined with delays in processing the new enrollments? Um, Mr. Chair, I mean, yes, uh, Congressman. <laughs> uh, it, it would be um, very difficult to continue the services uh, to the American people. As you know, the, um, the administrative costs for Medicare in uh, the budget year 2010 included no Affordable Care Act implementation because there was no Affordable Care Act. So what we're talking about is an enormous reduction in the overall um, ability to administer Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the Children's Insurance Program at a time when there are significantly more beneficiaries in each of those programs around the country. And it's not limited to CMS across your department. Vital public health, vital public safety functions would be jeopardized. Uh, for instance, and, uh, FDA would be cut uh, and would face uh, an effective cut of 17 percent for the remainder of this year. Wouldn't this be a cut of that? Wouldn't a cut of this magnitude seriously undermine FDA's responsibilities to uh, rapidly identify and respond to food-related health threats and its mission to protect patients from faulty or substandard drugs or devices? Well, Congressman, the um, President has recommended uh, about a 31 percent increase in the Food and Drug Administration because of the new responsibilities with the historic Food Safety Act and But he didn't initiatives. anticipate this kind of a cut in this year. He was proposing more no, money sir. for next year. The Republicans are proposing to cut a billion dollars in funding to the community health centers as part of a shocking nearly 50 percent reduction for programs Admitted, administered by the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. That cut to health centers would, could result in the closure, no, would result in the closure of 127 health centers and countless layoffs. Wouldn't that jeopardize uh, access to patient care? Well, community health centers have long been a bipartisan uh, effort to build a public health infrastructure delivering low, quali low cost, high quality preventive care around the country, and that would seriously impact people's health services. And for my last question about Medicaid, every state has a different Medicaid program. There's flexibility already in that program. At Tuesday's hearing, Governor Barber and 
Herbert asserted the need for total flexibility. Uh, uh, Go Governor Barber said, uh, problem is federal regulations don't allow, for, allow a provider to deny services to an individual on the basis of the individual's ability to pay. In addition, no cost-sharing measures can be imposed on many Medicaid enrollees, including children. Madam Secretary, can you talk about the flexibility that is already in the system and how that is balanced against the minimal levels of beneficiary and provider protections with regard to cost sharing, access to providers and more? The Medicaid program, as you say, is a federal state partnership and the program does look different in, in states around the country. Um, the program already has enormous flexibility and the Affordable Care Act uh, gives even more significant flexibility, designing benefit packages, uh, designing um, for some of the upper income uh, beneficiaries, uh, cost sharing, uh, making sure that um, optional services in some states are, are um, part of the package, in other states they are not. So there's a wide variety of, of program designs. Um, some are entirely in managed care, others are not. We are working actively, uh, as you know, the nation has a host of brand new governors um, and working actively with each of those states to uh, not only uh, give them a snapshot of what their program looks like, but also the strategies that have been implemented in other parts of the country that have been very effective in delivering care and saving costs. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, and we'll yield uh, five minutes to the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I don't want to take up too much time, but I would just point out to the ranking member of the full committee that the Democrats did have an entire year with which to come up with their budget and their appropriations. And it's only because they failed to do their work that we're doing the CR right now. Let me uh, direct your attention once again. I uh, know Chairman The House Pitts, passed it. The Senate Chairman Republican Pitts, stopped it. Just the time, I'm reclaiming my time. Chairman Pitts referenced Judge Vinson's uh, ruling in Florida from earlier in February, and I sent you a letter on February 10th asking you about the implementation plans of HHS, to which I have not yet received an answer. Um, my concern is Judge Vinson, in his ruling, said that a declaratory judgment is the functional equivalent of an injunction, and he went on to say that officials of the executive branch will adhere to the law as declared by the court. As a result, the declaratory judgment is a functional equivalent. The, the declaratory judgment is the functional equivalent of an injunction. There is no reason to conclude that this presumption should not apply here. You apparently feel differently, and we heard from our governors earlier this week that they are, in fact, feel like they're on. I think Governor Herbert said shifting sands. Uh, you feel that ultimately the individual mandate will be held, upheld as constitutional by the Supreme Court. Judge Vinson felt otherwise. We are in a period I, where I wish we could accelerate or expedite the Supreme Court, but apparently I don't get my wish. The Supreme Court will likely rule in June of 2012, and that is a long time for the states to look at this and wonder, which direction do we go? You could certainly provide some guidance and some help by saying, well, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna look seriously at what, Dr., what Judge Vinson said. So I still await a response from your letter, but could you briefly give me some, some, uh, some comfort that you're gonna comply with the judge's order? Congressman, I think it's um, far from clear what Judge Vinson's order indicates. So the Justice Department has gone back to the judge to ask him for a clarification of his order. Yeah, the reclaiming, of reclaiming my time, I, I, again, I think he stated it as, as clearly as he could. He is going to restate that, and I, I, I look forward to his decision as well. But honestly, the, the decision of a member of the executive branch not to adhere to the directive of the court is, I, I think, troubling. He did not file an injunction, as you know, which is the standard procedure if and but if attorneys, you've asked him to clarify and look forward to his but governors, governors all across this country right now, including including my state of Texas, and I know uh, Attorney General Greg Abbott is very concerned about what do we, you know, what do, we do now because we don't know. Let well, me, there uh, isn't anything now that is being done well, with the I look the forward to your written response to the letter I sent you a month ago, and, and I, I hope that uh, you will provide that for us. Uh, we've heard some, uh, some, some of the uh, questions have already centered around uh, 
some of the issues of mandatory funding within the, within the law that was signed last year. And I'm particularly concerned about section 4101, both A and B. 4101A provides mandatory spending for the construction and only the construction of school clinics. 4101B creates new discretionary funding for paying the doctors and nurses who are gonna work in those school clinics. So I guess the question is why is the construction mandatory and paying the staff discretionary. That's the way the bill was constructed by members of Congress. By members of the Senate Finance Committee staff. Um, and to take up on where uh, Chairman uh, Upton was talking just a moment ago, uh, I, I would draw your attention in the law to uh, Section 1311. It's on page... Uh, page 79, 78 of my copy of the law, where under enhancing patient safety, beginning on January 1, 2015, a qualified health plan may contract with Part B, a health care provider, only if such provider implements such mechanisms to improve health care quality as the secretary may by regulation require. I mean, that's pretty specific too. So where are you going with this? What have you directed your staff to look at? I mean, again, providers all over the country are asking me, what does this mean for us? Well, again, perhaps I, I could get that response in ready. But, you know, I think, look, we switched sides here in January. And the reason we switched sides was because of this law. It is precisely because of this type of language in this law that the American people looked at this and rejected the notion of what was forced upon them last year. There is unprecedented power now that goes to your office, unprecedented spending that goes to your office. These are decisions that are made exclusively by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. At no other time in our history has so much power gone to one federal agency. Can you understand why the American people are understandably concerned by what has happened to them? Congressman, I, I think that the American public should be alarmed if we are paying taxpayer dollars to any provider or a hospital bed of over 50, which doesn't have a quality system in but place. But quality determined I, by the secretary. <laughs> quality determined by the secretary and no other, no, no, no right of appeal, no, no secondary motion may be made, only by the secretary. That's what's offensive. It would be in offensive. the CMS guidelines in terms of payments for Medicare pay, pays that... When that rule is promulgated, there'll be plenty of public input. But again, I think it would be alarming if we paid taxpayer dollars yeah. without yeah, I just add that 10 rules have gone without public comment. 10 rules have gone in. Gentlemen's time action. has expired. Uh, yield five minutes to the ranking member uh, emeritus, Mr. Dingell. Welcome, Madam Secretary. It's a pleasure to see you here. Your old dad, Sir. who served on this committee with me and worked in this room, would be very proud of what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, questions. <clears throat> With regard to the Affordable Care Act, the continuing resolution, H.R. 1, makes a number of blunt and reckless cuts in programs that are critical to the health and the well-being of the American people. At the same time, the Affordable Care Act has begun implementing historic consumer protections, including ensuring coverage for children with pre-existing conditions, prohibiting rescissions on coverage by insurance companies, allowing children up to 26 to stay on their parents' insurance, amongst others. Under H.R. 1, CMS would receive a cut of $458 million, or more than 23% of the, that agency's 2010 budget. Will H.R. 1 delay or impede the implementation of the consumer protection protection provisions of the Health Reform Act, yes or no? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you please give us for the record a statement as to how and where these cuts will come and what will be the effect on the, on the uh, programs involved? Uh, Madam Secretary, the Affordable Care Act provides seniors on Medicare with a 50% discount on brand name drugs, a critical step towards increasing the coverage under Medicare Part D. Will H.R. 1 delay or prevent the seniors from receiving this discount? Yes or no? Mr. Chairman, the cuts to um, Medicare services will... But it is a danger. Pardon me? But it is a danger that it will yes, affect sir. those provisions. Yes, sir. All right, Madam Secretary, just yesterday we heard from Medicare Program Integrity Group Director John Spiegel. 
regarding the anti-fraud efforts at CMS, including the new tools provided by ACA to prevent fraud before it occurs. Will HR1 delay or harm efforts to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicaid or Medicare? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Would you submit for the record a statement as to how and why? Madam Secretary, with regard to food safety, as you know, uh, another important undertaking is the implementation of FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. This legislation made historic investments in our food safety system and provided new authorities to help FDA to prevent food safety programs before they occur throughout the food supply. H.R. 1 included $241 million in cuts from the FDA. Will this cut or these cuts impede FDA's ability to implement the Food Safety Modernization Act? Yes. Yes, yes sir, or no? Yes, sir, they will. Would you please explain that for the record, if you please, Madam Secretary? Yes, sir. Madam Secretary, last Congress I joined with my colleagues, uh, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Pallone, and Mr. Stupak to introduce drug safety legislation that would give the FDA the authorities and resources it needs to adequately protect consumers from unsafe drugs and to monitor our food safety, or rather our, the safety of our drug supply. Will HR1 impede FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research from evaluating and monitoring drugs for safety and effectiveness? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Madam, would you submit an explanation as to why that is so? Madam Secretary, the FDA is consistently and chronically underfunded. And I continue to hope that FDA uh, will get needed registration fees to help fully implement the food safety law. I note that those fees would have, were approved by and supported by the industry. Do you believe that registration fees are necessary to implementing the Food Safety Modernization Act? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Madam Secretary, uh, you have been requested, or the department has been requested, to produce uh, documents for the benefit of this committee. I would note, Madam Secretary, that uh, HHS has produced over 50,000 uh, 50, documents, I note at significant expense in response to the committee's requests related to the waiver process and the creation of CCIO. Would you uh, submit to the statement, or rather submit to the committee a statement as to uh, how you have complied with that request for papers uh, and documents and what, what seem to be the problems, if any, that exist with regard to the committee's requests for information? I, I'd be happy to submit that. Madam yeah. Secretary, we have completed our business with 11 seconds over. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, uh, and <laughs> Chair recognize the Chair Emeritus of the committee, Mr. Barton. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Ms. Madam Secretary. Uh, congratulations to your Jayhawks for beating my Texas Aggies last night in basketball. Uh, I hated to see it, but uh, y'all were the better team. Um, I think Dr. Burgess asked this question, but I'm I may ask it in a little bit different way. I think you're very well aware that a, a federal court has recently ruled that the uh, health care law that uh, became law last year is unconstitutional. Uh, as the uh, chief administrative um, executive in charge of implementing that law, uh, what is your position on uh, agreeing to the court order and ceasing to implement the new law? Do you intend to agree with it? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to appeal it? Uh, could you enlighten us as to what uh, your position is on this recent court ruling? Well, Congressman Barton, thank you on behalf of the Hawks. Yeah. We have sought a clarification from Judge Vinson um, about the implication both for the plaintiff states as well as the membership of the um, NFIB, which is one of the plaintiffs in the Florida case. Uh, once we get that clarification, uh, we intend then to um, take next steps. In the meantime, we are actively implementing the law because, as you know, Judge Vinson is uh, now uh, an outlier in terms of what the other federal judges, the four other judges who have ruled, 
um, have ruled very differently than the judge. So we're seeking clarification and, and continuing to What's your ahead. timeline on that? Well, the plaintiffs and the, um, uh, we expect to hear back from the judge soon. Uh, the DOJ has filed their uh, clarification requests. The plaintiffs have responded um, this week, and the judge indicated that he would rule very quickly. Is it, is it once that information is received from the judges, whose decision is it? Is it your decision? Is it the attorney general's decision? Is it the president's decision? Uh, or all of the above on how to proceed? Well, our legal team is led by the Department of Justice, so we defer to their legal counsel. Do you, do you have um, official input into the decision? In other words... Into the legal counsel's decision? Well, you are I'm, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So. I understand. Um, I, our legal counsel is involved with the justice team, but they are proceeding to have this dialogue with the court. Okay. I would disagree with you that it, the judge's decision was an outlier. Um, my understanding is that, that in, if you're keeping score, it's two to two, so I don't... No, it's three to two. Have we, uh, had, an, have we had another one? <laughs> I, I have to keep an accurate score. Um, and as I say, there are 12 who have dismissed the case outright, so... All right. Um, and... Congressman, the, the clarification I would make is that in the other decision uh, which came out of a court um, in Virginia where the judge found an individual responsibility to be the one portion of the law that he found unconstitutional, he d disagreed with Judge Vinson's um, description that it was essential to strike down the entire law. And yeah, so that's that. what I meant in terms of the outlier. And I guess one uh, one last question on that: it, Is it conceivable that uh, the, the Obama administration would appeal direct, if the decision is to appeal, would appeal directly to the Supreme Court so that we get this thing solved, uh, hopefully before the next presidential election? Congressman, the Attorney General of the state of Virginia has filed an expedited appeal to the United States Supreme Court asking them to grant cert in the case in Virginia. Um, the administration has opposed that um, decision to expedite, but that is now before the court, so that's ripe, and the court will make a decision on whether or not they intend to expedite this case. My time's just about expired. I've got a number of questions for the for the record, I will submit in writing. My final question is on NIH. Uh, several years ago, we passed an NIH reform bill through this committee that uh, was signed into law. That bill um, uh, was a reauthorization bill. It lapsed several years ago, and it's up for renewal. I'm going to encourage Chairman Upton to uh, have a hearing and hopefully do a reauthorization on that later this year or next year. But in that was the creation of a common fund to try to get more cross-semination, uh, insemination between the various uh, NIH organizations. Uh, have you followed that? And if so, could you give us uh, uh, an update on how you believe that, that common fund is operating? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I know that the um, new director of the National Institutes of Health has, has um, taken a great interest in the common fund. and has uh, been actively involved in not only seeking to fill gaps in, in research, but um, directing it to the most promising um, options he feels in, in the research field. So I think it has been something that has been um, definitely uh, a stream of funding that has been very important and one that I, I would be happy to get some detail from Dr. Collins on exactly where those funds are being directed, but it's something that he, he takes very seriously. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And thank the gentleman's you. time has expired. Uh, Chair yields five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I've been listening to the uh, whining and complaining on the other side of the aisle, and uh, um, it, it just really boggles my mind. Uh, Madam Secretary, the bottom line is do we want to provide uh, American citizens with health care or, or don't we? Uh, I know there hasn't been any enthusiasm for the Affordable uh, Care Act on the other side of the aisle, but, you know, let's try to improve it uh, rather than try to, to uh, destroy it. 
Um, I, I, I noted with uh, a bit of a chuckle the um, uh, assault on the um, Massachusetts law. Uh, the fact is that the governor of Massachusetts came here and said that the law is working, and I wonder if uh, Governor Romney is going to run on his strong implementation of that law in the Republican uh, primaries uh, when he runs for president. Uh, Madam Secretary, what are the most dangerous things in the Republican cuts, as you see it, uh, from, from your uh, very important uh, point of view of providing uh, health care uh, for Americans and all the other things uh, that are in the Republican plans for funding uh, the government? W what do you see as the most draconian of the cuts, and, and how would it affect the health of the American people? Congressman, the President feels strongly that um, education, innovation, um, building our key blocks for the future. So the investment in early childhood education, which pays huge dividends down the road, the investment in scientific research to keep us at the front of uh, biomedical innovation, the uh, infrastructure for public health delivery with community health centers and funding the training of providers, all of those are jeopardized uh, without um, you know, having adequate funding in the future, as well as essential services. The, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and are looking at increased beneficiaries and a very restricted budget, and our efforts to have new fraud, waste, and abuse efforts, which are really paying off, are very much in jeopardy. You know, um, what, what I see in, in terms of the Republican plan for, for funding the government, it's not a matter of the fact that we need to cut to balance our budget. We do need to balance our budget, and I, I find it odd that we're giving these huge tax breaks to wealthy people, um, and that blows a hole in the budget, and, and uh, I find that very interesting. But it's an attempt, as I can see it, to get rid of all the programs uh, Republicans haven't liked for all these years, and to try to tie it in and kind of use the, the, uh, the budget um, problems to do that. You know, we see it on a state level in Wisconsin, we see it all over the country, and we see it on a national level as well. We had uh, Governor Barber here, and he uh, he complained that uh, he didn't uh, he didn't like uh, the, the, the Affordable Health Care Act, and he would agree to a block uh, a grant. Uh, do you think the people of Mississippi would be better off four years from now under Governor Barber's block grant program or under the Affordable Care Act? Congressman, I don't know a lot of the details about um, the Mississippi health care situation. I do know that they have a, a population that by poverty level qualifies them for the highest FMAP rate. And one of the challenges of any kind of block grant is um, if you would look at the recent economic downturn when millions more Americans qualified for Medicaid because they lost their jobs or their incomes took a drastic downturn. No state um, would have any help from the federal government in responding to that. It shifts huge burdens, frankly, onto state bases and doesn't have a federal partnership moving forward. Let me, let me ask you this. Uh, there have been a number of uh, criticisms of the pre-existing condition insurance program, and I'd like to just review the facts. First, there was concern over whether there won't be enough money for all the people that will enroll. Then we heard that very few have enrolled, and both criticisms were asserted as failures. Uh, how many people have enrolled, and, and what changes uh, have you made to the program in response? And let me throw out another question tying in with this. Governor Barbara Tuesday's uh, hearing asserted they were unable to run the program. So were states, were states given the opportunity to run the program? Could they have run it in combination with existing uh, high-risk pools in the states? And the I irony, I, as I see it, is that a high-risk pool was essentially a touted feature in the Republican proposal for health reform, debated right in this very committee last year. So I wonder if you can comment on those things. Well, there are now um, approximately 12,000 people across this country who are enrolled in their state or the federal high-risk pool, and the enrollment increased by about 50 percent over the last couple of months. Many states are finally got their programs set up, are doing aggressive outreach, are informing people. But as you know, there are some pretty strict requirements. You have to be uninsured for six months, uh, which is a barrier to a lot of folks. Uh, and 
the insurance, even though it's capped at market rates, is still not inexpensive coverage. Um, this was always designed as a bridge strategy to try and get to 2014 when uh, the market rules will change. And for the first time ever in the history of this country, we will have insurance available without regard to people's pre-existing health condition. They will be able to participate in a broad-based pool. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, welcome. We've been waiting to visit with you for a, a long time. Um, I would just, I would state that, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that NFIB, which is the National Federation of Independent Businessmen, were plaintiffs. Uh, when I thought they've got such great small business tax credits that uh, I, I wouldn't really expect them to be in opposition to this law. I just... I'm, I'm just surprised to hear that. Uh, the other thing, you were a governor of a state, um, and I would imagine that had you been governing, what, um, did you ever pass, a, when you under your uh, governorship was budgets passed? Did you pass bu budgets when you were governor? Yes, sir. Was the chambers held by uh, just Democrats in the Senate and the House? Or did you have? Never. What, what's that? Never. Never. And you passed budgets? We did. And in the last Congress, we held, uh, Democrats held the House of Representatives. I, that's true, right? And the House passed a budget. And the, they also held the Senate? They did. And we have a Democratic president? Yes, we do. And we didn't pass a budget? I think the House passed a budget. So I'm, my, I'm, I'm, I guess I am trying to be a little cute. The point is... The Democratic attack on the CR is because of their failure to pass a budget. So they can, they can position all they want. Um, you know, we're in the majority because they can't pass a budget. With a general we're in, no, I, no, I will not. We're in the majority because they passed this bill, came a law. We're in the majority because they passed cap and trade. Our frustration is... The last time you visited this committee was February 4, 2010. The last time. This bill was not even the law of the land. Uh, I became ranking member of the health subcommittee after that vote, Nathan Deal left. And I think I asked the ch then chairman, Waxman, and, and, and Frank Pallone, who really is a, a great friend, 19 times to ask you to come visit us. Um, you never came. Why? Do, why, didn't you, did, why didn't you come after the law to help us understand the provisions and the implementation of this law? Congressman, I, I responded to the request that I got. So, so you're saying we never requested you to come back? Yes, sir. Okay, so Chairman Waxman did not ask you to come back to help explain this law. Would the gentleman yield? No, I will not. Referencing the chairman. No, I will not. And it's not I accurate. will not. Will you answer the question, Madam Secretary? Um, chairman Waxman never asked you. Congressman, I will go back. I need to look at the record. I, okay. All I can tell you is Will I you submit the answer the for the record in writing? Happy to. Thank you very much. Let me go. This, this is really a budget. Our frustration is there's so many particular problems and concerns, we haven't had a chance to really talk to you. This is a budget hearing, so let's talk about a budget issue. In that February 4, 2010 hearing, I asked you a question. It was kind of the same way. And then you admitted that the $500 billion Medicare cuts, there were $500 billion in Medicare cuts. Is that correct? No, sir, it is not correct. Well, I would refer I, I, dollars I'm reclaiming my time. I would, I would refer spending. you to the transcript. Sir. And I'll read it if you want me to. The growth rate was Mr. Shimkus, in Medicare so the to president supports cutting five hundred billion dollars in Medicare, yes or no? Secretary Sebelius. The president is supportive of the health reform legislation. That's is that correct. a yes? Secretary Sebelius. I said yes, sir. So our problem in this whole debate on the Medicare cuts... The legislation doesn't include $500 Madam, million dollars uh, worth uh, of my cuts. My concern is the budget hearing. So there is, a, there is an issue here on the budget because your own actuary has said you can't double count. 
You can't count 500. They're, they're attacking Medicare on the CR when their bill, your law, cut $500 billion in Medicare. Then you're also using the same $500 billion to what? Say you're funding health care. Your own actuary says you can't do both. So my simple question, I have 20 se 26 seconds left. What's the $500 billion cuts for? Preserving Medicare or funding health care law? Which is it? So the Affordable Care Act adds 12 years to the Medicare Trust Fund, according to every actuary, and the $500 billion represents a slowdown in the growth rate of Medicare over 10 years from what was projected at 8% to a growth so rate So is it of Medicare? Is it using it to save Medicare? Or are you using it to fund health care reform? Which one? Both. The gentleman's so you're double counting. I yield back my time. General gentleman's time has expired. Je uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Caps, for five minutes for questions. I'm pleased to yield 10 seconds to the ranking member of the subcommittee. I just want to say, Mr. Shimkus, you, you shouldn't be asking the secretary about whether we invited her. The fact of the matter is that Mr. Waxman and myself did not invite her after the health care bill passed. And you could simply address that to us. And the answer is no, we didn't invite her. So it's not that she failed to come. We did not invite her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Pallone. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Madam Secretary, and welcome to our subcommittee. I want to acknowledge um, and support the interest that was expressed by former Chairman Barton in the uh, uh, common fund, as he was describing, and you answered uh, how much the current secretary of NIH or chairman of NIH is supporting it as well. It was his idea, and he got it funded in 2006. And point out to my colleagues that HR1, the continuing resolution, cuts $48.5 million uh, from the common fund. You know, these are tight fiscal times, and I think the president's budget identifies areas for smart investments that will pay off both in improvements in the nation's health and economic stability. Uh, the President has called on our nation to come together to out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build our competitors. I support this focus, and I think the HHS is in a strong position to help us reach these goals. As a nurse, I'm concerned about strengthening the health workforce. We face a primary care shortage now, and as we move into implementation of health reform, we're going to need an even more robust health care workforce. As you know, the Affordable Care Act lays out a course for creating that workforce, uh, creating a, a commission to help guide analysis and recommendations of workforce enhancement, providing primary care providers a pay increase through both Medicare and Medicaid, and providing enough service, enough funding to more than triple the National Health Service Corps. But we in Congress need to support these programs for proper implementation. So I'm very concerned that the House Continuing Resolution would cut workforce programs by about $145 million from the fiscal year 2010 level, slashing vital Title VII and Title VIII programs by nearly a third. I'm particularly um, worried about Title VIII programs which support the education and training of nurses. We have a nursing shortage. Last year, over 50,000 qualified applicants were turned away from nursing schools due to budget constraints and a lack of faculty uh, to uh, train them. Madam Secretary, you understand this. The President's budget provided an increase in these same programs. Can you discuss the steps taken in the budget to strengthen our health care workforce the, and increase the numbers of jobs which will result from that? Well, Congresswoman, I, I think there's no doubt that the President shares your concern about the health workforce of the future, which is why he has made it a focus um, each year in his budget and why I think the Affordable Care Act also focused on, on workforce enhancements. So the budget would include um, support, as you say, to uh, train about 10,600 National Health Service Corps providers, uh, train an additional 4,000 new primary care providers over the next five years. Um, the Prevention and Public Health Fund allocation uh, would also uh, increase the number of nurse practitioners. Uh, 600 nurse practitioners would be trained. Uh, 600 new physician assistants across the country would be available. Uh, with the establishment of new community health centers, there would be providers available in the most underserved areas. So there are a whole series of workforce enhancements that would be right. jeopardized either by defunding the Affordable Care Act or not passing the recommended president's budget. 
And what concerns me is that the House continuing resolution would be a, a reduction of 54 percent, cutting our workforce programs by more than half in all of the areas that you specified. I think this is going to devastate our health care workforce, and I, I hope you'll just quickly agree with me. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> I needed that for the record. Um, what puzzles me is that I know my colleagues across the aisle have expressed concerns that we don't have enough health care workforce, um, but I share their concern, and this, the key to addressing this problem is right in front of us, and yet they propose cuts that will make the situation worse. Their budget will hamper efforts uh, to fill the gaps that we have today, uh, and, and uh, just as the demand for health care professionals increases. In my last minute, I'd like to address something you mentioned in your remarks, which are uh, the uh, $4 billion uh, in waste, fraud, and abuse that HHS and the Department of Justice has recovered just in this past year. $4 billion that was saved for American taxpayers. When I'm home uh, meeting with my seniors uh, in uh, health group advocates as well about how they can be active participants now in looking for waste, fraud, and abuse, we want this to continue. Uh, some of it is in the Medicare payments. Would you ex expand upon uh, this uh, $4 billion in savings and ways that we can in look to increase this amount over the future? Well, the President's budget, again, has requested additional resources. Uh, this is an enormous payoff in terms yes. of uh, dollars returned for dollars spent. Uh, we're building uh, new data systems that can allow us to spot billing irregularities in a much more timely fashion, recredentialing providers, putting in place strike forces. We'd like to expand those strike forces, which have been enormously helpful in the fraud hotspots. Uh, but this collaborative effort with not only our partners at Justice, but local attorneys general and, and states has been enormously effective so far, and we hope to be able to expand and broaden that outreach. Thank you. The lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dr. Murphy, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Secretary. Three things I think I'm going to try and put out that we agree on. First of all, that both Pitt and Kansas both deserve to be in the final four. <laughs> a, a yes would be good. I'll take that as a yes. yes thanks. Sir. thanks. Number two, this committee and, uh, worked very hard together, and uh, my, my friend and colleague Jean Green and I worked together on, uh, and it passed the House, 417 to 1, a bill to allow doctors to volunteer at community health centers. Now, I know the estimates are that huge numbers of more people will go to community health centers. With the CBO analysis of, of this, however, just said that using the Federal Torts Claim Act and using only those numbers, because that's all they're allowed to look at, I think the cost over several years was $30 million. But I'm asking if your uh, department could work with us and coming up with more detail and analysis of if we allowed doctors to volunteer at community health centers, what would the cost savings be in terms of allowing more patients to go through those centers? Is that something that you could help us come up I'd with? I'd be glad to work with you on that. That would be extremely patient. helpful because you know that we have huge um, rates of, of, of vacancies for jobs in those centers and that would be very helpful. <clears throat> and I have no doubt that this committee and, and this House will pass it again. Will you, will you help the nudge, nudge the senators, help them understand the great value in this as well? We don't try and put pressure on them, but perhaps you can perhaps add some wisdom to them. <clears throat> Second thing, or the third thing, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, it's a group of academic and community-based centers that, give, um, that, that disseminate standards in clinical excellence in care of traumatized children. It's funded through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Act. When I read your budget proposal, however, it seems like the administration, although you were supportive of the program, there were some cuts to the program. Um, actually, it cut the funding from $40 million to $10 million, but at the same time, the SAMHSA budget is calling for major increases in spending in a number of other areas, such as increased spending for military families initiatives for um, uh, service grants, uh, uh, some things for homeless, uh, some things for health information technology programs, $4 million there, even though we put $20 billion on HIT in, in other areas. Um, and, and certainly you know that with regard to homelessness, there is a high correlation between childhood trauma and homelessness. And in my own experience of working with uh, servicemen and women at Bethesda Naval Hospital, my own clinical experience as a psychologist also tells me that there is a higher risk for people with, for PTSD and homelessness and other trauma if they themselves experience a great deal of trauma in their lives when they were younger. Uh, and I think you have like $2.37 in homeless grants through HUD and other things for, um, for veterans. 
although I believe the VA should be handling some of this. Is this something you were able to relook at and see that perhaps we should be spending more in the early treatment and prevention? Uh, let the VA handle some of the other things for, for veterans. But, but to, to revisit that, uh, so make sure we're not cutting some of the treatment programs out of uh, the childhood treatment of trauma. Well, I would be um, glad to um, have that discussion with Pam Hyde, who is the uh, director of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services. I can tell you she's absolutely committed to uh, prevention as being the, the most effective treatment possibility. So I will, I will certainly circle back with her about your concern about that particular program. Thank you. I know that the VA, for example, has 14 homeless programs and initiatives. And, and although I, I do want to support all those, I also recognize that we're, we'd, we would do well to help prevent some of these problems for a lot of them too. Uh, finally, an area of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, those programs were designed in 1965, and I oftentimes liken it to none of us are driving a 1965 car, and if we had one, we'd put a lot of patches and repairs to it over time. Um, whenever I talk to medical subspecialties in a wide range of areas, cardiology being one, I think 40% of our money is spent on cardiovascular disease. Uh, very often, when we ask the question, if you were to design Medicare today, would it look anything like the Medicare of 1965? And I'm assuming you would agree, no. Uh, could you tell me what major initiatives you have in mind that really help us perhaps even redesign this from the ground up, particularly for some of the major disease entities such as cardiovascular disease, lung disease, cancer, et cetera? Well, Congressman, the Affordable Care Act actually includes a um, major direction that uh, the Medicare incentives be redesigned and aligned with uh, quality outcomes and um, healthcare strategies that we know are not only more patient-centered um, outcomes like medical home models and bundling care to prevent um, unnecessary hospital readmissions, but the Medicare incentives, I would say, are right now aligned to volume and not value. So we are in the process through the Centers for Innovation, through working with providers across this country to try and capture the best possible patient practices. I, I hope you'll do that. I know my time's those. up, but yes. the, the academies and colleges of various specialties of medicine have standards and protocols, and I hope you will look to them for some guidance on We're that. We're working very closely with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary. The chairs, um, thanks, gentlemen. The gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Madam Secretary. I do want to address uh, a comment that was made by a, a fellow Texan that the uncertainty that is out there regarding the constitutionality of the mandate and wondering <clears throat> what the Texas Attorney General uh, has to do and, and that he's wondering what he has to do as well as our governor Rick Perry Well, those two gentlemen also represent me and I do have a suggestion as to what they could be doing in the meantime They could be coming up with a solution to make health care insurance affordable for Texans So that employers have access to it at a reasonable price to offer it to their employees and that Texas its citizens have affordable insurance products available to them so that we don't lead the nation in the uninsured. That's what they could be doing. That's just a suggestion. I'm sure they've thought of it. We've heard that the American people want us to balance the budget, reduce the national debt. And we all agree, and I think the President's fiscal year 2012 budget places us in a good place to accomplish that. But I don't think the American people said, and while you're doing this, expose us to dangerous drugs or continue a health care insurance industry that does not provide us adequate, affordable, accessible coverage. I don't think they said that. So I join you and I join the administration and I believe that I join members on the other side of the aisle in that objective. Now, we may have different plans on how to get there, but the truth is nothing was done until we passed the Affordable Care Act. The discussion is ongoing, and it will be a continuing debate, but the need still exists, the problems still exist. We can debate this thing and just continue to hemorrhage. 
So I will ask you this, Madam Secretary. We hear so much about market forces. And just let the free markets take care of all of this. And I think in large measure we all agree with that. To a point. Until the markets are dysfunctional. Until the markets don't deliver what is necessary without the incentives and the direction sometimes. And a push and a shove. But mostly a collaborative effort. Which I think is what the President is seeking to do. When it comes to the FDA, why not just let an industry police itself? Why don't we just let them do that? Well, Mr. Congressman, we've seen, um, I think, the, the result of a lack of regulation in way too many areas uh, that have just gone terribly awry. Um, I think the FDA is certainly seeking to make sure that the 25 cents of every consumer dollar which comes in a product that um, is under the umbrella of that agency, whether it's, it's drugs and devices or our food supply, is safe and secure. And frankly, I, I think in many cases the industry is very supportive of those efforts. Uh, in the food debate um, for the new food safety bill that we just had, the industry ultimately takes the economic hit from an unsafe product being available to consumers. There's a huge ripple effect that um, ends up penalizing the food industry. So they are eager for a regulatory oversight and they're, they're willing and able to actually help finance that regulatory oversight. And I do believe it's a collaborative. It's a partnership. But I think government has a, a responsibility to protect the welfare and safety and health of our constituents. That's what we were hired to do and provide them with opportunities. The last question is, and I'm very concerned about uh, NIH because I'm having all of my universities, they're all coming, and, and these are Democrats and Republicans, and they all have basically the same request. What's going to happen to replace those particular funds that are so essential? Again, why is NIH so necessary? Why don't we just allow the public, uh, the private sector, to make those funds available to our universities well, Congressman, as, as you know, one of the areas that um, the United States leads the world is um, biomedical research. And it has been a, an enormously important partnership between the commercial industry and the research that um, goes on in universities across the country, funded in large part by NIH, which is why I think the president has recommended a, an increase um, to the NIH budget, which is already looking at a um, losing the two years of enhanced funding from the Recovery Act and trying to make sure that we continue those, those breakthroughs that are happening um, all across this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for being with us. Uh, I found uh, your opening statement a little bit curious. Uh, you mentioned that you think that it's uh, the responsibility of the administration to give every family and business the chance to thrive while making the investments that will grow our economy and create jobs. And I, I just have to tell you, being out there and holding listening sessions in my district and with some of my colleagues, uh, the American people do not want to be dependent on the federal government for their cars, their loans, their home loans, their housing, their education, and their health care. What they would like to do is see the regulation reduced and to see the federal government get out of the way. So I, I would ask you, do you have any data that shows that uh, businesses are actually getting relief on the cost of the insurance that they are paying every year? Do you have any data that is verified that says this is lowering costs? Because we are hearing the opposite and are actually being shown bills and estimates th for that. Congresswoman, if you're talking about data um, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, um, yes, of as Obama you know, Care. the yes, law was signed um, just about a year ago, what we have seen is with the enhanced 
rate regulation. There are numbers of states that actually have used those new tools to uh, lower the impact of rate increases. Could you and that supply that? Because we I are not be happy seeing that in that. Tennessee. And I know Tennessee had to come to you for one of the 900 waivers. And I know they're appreciative for that. Let me ask you about the 1115 waivers. Uh, when you grant a waiver, and it seems like you all are doing more of that, uh, is that waiver, does that take the elected officials in that state out of the decision-making equation? Is that waiver granted to the governor's office between CMS and the governor's office? Because that's the way 10 care was done. We as state legislators were taken out of the equation. Actually, um, Congresswoman, the traditional 1115 waiver was uh, a dialogue between CMS and the governor's office. The Affordable Care Act changes that provision, so now there is a notice requirement, there are public hearing requirements, there is input opportunity, so the waiver process actually has been amended by uh, the Affordable Care Act to uh, include far more transparency. Okay, I'd like to call to your attention, this is the reason it's so important to me. Today's Wall Street Journal, Obama's Health Waiver Gambit, and it talks about Ms. Cutter and Ms. DeParle saying privately to your liberal interest groups that this is a way to increase centralization, for instance, with a state-based public option or even single payer. And I tell you why this is of concern to me. We had Governor Patrick in here this week, and his Medicaid, state Med Medicaid director, is on the record having said that when you look at the way the market Medicaid works that he's beginning to favor a single payer. And I would just submit to you, this is not what the American people want. They do not want the federal government that can't tend to the items that are on their plate making the decisions for their health care. And we hear it from them every single day. And ma'am, it is of concern. If Congresswoman, that is not at all. First of all, we don't design any waiver. The state comes to us. I've seen the applications a, from my state, and well, I respect that, and I understand that. The rules aren't even developed for the program you are I do want to move on. Uh, fraud. You mentioned fraud. Uh, we had a hearing on this this week. Are you able to quantify the amount of fraud that is there in Medicare and Medicare? And then, no, ma'am. Okay, so the $4 billion that you feel like you saved, you don't have a way to quantify what the problem is. And how we don't know how, how widespread. If we knew how big it was, we'd hopefully shut it down. And what percentage of your energy this year is going to go to addressing that fraud? What percent of my energy? Yeah, your resources and energy. I mean, when we hear organized crime getting into Medicare and Medicaid fraud, I think it should cause us all. So if you could just let us know uh, your resources, there what you plan to put into that. There are significant resources requested in the budget. Um, okay. And another question and I would like to, your budget this year, your request is $891 billion, your 08 budget, which... Uh, we would love to return to those numbers. It was $708 billion, and you mentioned that you have cut, in your testimony, four programs, but um, are you list four programs that you cut? Are those the only cuts that you all made, or were there others? No, Congresswoman, there are about $5 billion worth of cuts. Our budget uh, proposal Do you is mind below submitting the 2010 that list to us? I would be happy to. That would be great. You're below 2010, but not down to 08. I yell back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Thanks the, uh, Mr. General Chairman, a point of uh, personal privilege here or whatever. Yeah, let the, me just the say. The secretary uh, should be allowed to answer the question. That's correct. Uh, the, the gentle lady's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Madam Secretary, do you wish to add additional response? It, you may continue to respond in writing as well uh, if you feel like you have not adequately Thank you, responded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wisconsin's, uh, Ms. Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin, for five minutes for question. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for being here. Uh, earlier, I, I wanted to start by reacting to some of the um, uh, other comments that were made. I think it was Dr. Burgess who noted that we switched sides. And it was because of this law referring to the Affordable Care Act or health care reform. And I disagree. I think the last election was about jobs, jobs, jobs. But instead of focusing on jobs, the new majority has made it their first order of business to repeal the Affordable Care Act. That was one of the first votes we took this session. 
which is already in my community providing life-saving coverage to many who didn't have it before and improving uh, their access and the affordability of their health care. And instead of focusing on jobs, the new majority has attempted also to deny funding to continue implementing the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform bill we passed last session. Instead of focusing in on jobs, the new majority has offered House Resolution 1 that Moody's uh, earlier this week said would lead to the loss of 700,000 jobs in the United States. And instead of focusing in on jobs, some of our new governors are presenting budgets embedded with policies that would gut Medicaid and would thwart at the state level the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. It's precisely what's happening in my home state of Wisconsin, which used to have a reputation as being a leader in health care and a leader in preparation for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Now, I don't envy you your job right now. Uh, it, it is um, uh, you know, working to implement these vital, life-saving, important reforms when so many are working so hard to see that legislation thwarted, uh, roadblocks placed, etc. But I want to focus back on um, House Resolution 1, the continuing resolution that passed in the House a couple of weeks ago. I, I brought uh, an amendment to the floor to restore funding to the community health centers. Uh, my amendment was um, fully paid for, uh, but unfortunately the Republicans barred me from offering, uh, offering that. But H.R. 1 slashes uh, over a billion dollars to community health centers for the remaining seven months of this fiscal year. If, if this ultimately uh, is, is passed and becomes law, I, I guess I'd like to hear from you, from you how, how you even go about uh, implementing that? How does this and who rely on the wonderful community health centers that uh, provide services in my area? Uh, I, I've, I've heard that um, this will impact uh, coverage to probably 11 million Americans. Uh, it will result in job losses and closure of clinics. Uh, do you drive if you were forced to implement such draconian cuts, how would you go about that? What, what, would, what would we see at the local level? Well, Congresswoman, I share your view that um, the community health center um, footprint is incredibly important, um, and both with the Recovery Act and the budget investments and the Affordable Care Act, that footprint will double over the period of the next five years, serving closer to 40 million people. Um, we are already seeing that increase. There are about 10 million additional Americans served thanks to the Recovery Act investments, and they are in the most underserved areas. And with those, community health centers are providers and often providing a host of community services. So um, the effort to now deny care, uh, fire, health care providers who would lose their jobs and um, restrict access in the most underserved rural and urban communities to affordable, available health care will just put additional burdens on already strapped city and state budgets. Those folks will come through the doors of emergency rooms in larger numbers. They will be um, sicker on the job. They will be unable to uh, take care of their kids. There'll be students who won't do as well in school because their health needs won't be attended to. And I think that has a serious impact not only the health of this nation, but on certainly the prosperity of the nation. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingrey, for five minutes for questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Secretary Sebelius, uh, in testimony for this committee on January the 26th, I asked Mr. Cass Sunstein from the White House Office of Reg Regulatory Affairs if he knew who had the authority within your administration to slip a Medicare end-of-life service rate into a final rule without first allowing for public comment. And he testified under oath that, and I quote, the Secretary of HHS has considerable authority over her rules, end quote. 
Madam Secretary, in yes or no, did you make the decision to publish this end-of-life payment rate without allowing for public comment? Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate your forthrightness on, on that. I, I, I really do. But, you know, it flies in the face of the comment, the, the response that you just gave to uh, my colleague from Tennessee regarding the 1115 uh, waiver program. Uh, and you described how it formally worked uh, between the department and directly with the governor's office and calling for more oversight and public hearing and uh, transparency. So uh, would you agree that in the future uh, that rather than making that decision unilaterally, even though you have the power to do it, uh, that it may be a little time for public comment would have been appropriate in regard to that? Congressman, the uh, rule, as you know, was uh, followed the outline that was directed in the Affordable Care Act in terms of the provisions for a um, wellness visit. In addition, we looked at the original Medi welcome to Medicare visit and the one element that wasn't consistent. Yeah, I, I, wish, I, I wish I had enough time to listen to your but, full answer, well, but if you could respond did, yes or no to that. More we, transparency, we got more feedback, opportunity for public yes, comment. Sir, and that's why it's not part of the final rule. We decided and, that it was better And I better would hope that that is it. a yes answer. Uh, let, me, let me move on. In, in the President's uh, uh, fiscal year 2012 budget, uh, your department requested $93 million for information and education in order to sign American workers up for the CLASS Act. This is that same program that you just recently told the Senate Finance Committee, I guess a few weeks ago, that the program was unsustainable. Now, those are your words. Do you believe it's appropriate for the administration to solicit money from American workers for a health program that is, quote, totally unsustainable? Sir, my comment was that it was unsustainable as the legislation was crafted but I was given considerable flexibility and we are in the process of making, I think, the changes that will meet the criteria outlined in the law, which is that it be sustainable without taxpayer um, support. Well, thank you. Uh, given the current budget crisis that we have in this country, and I think everybody on the dais, and, and certainly you would agree with this, uh, we have a tremendous budget crisis. And understanding that you are asking for money to sign people up for a program that you say is unsustainable. Will you pledge here today to work with this committee to ensure that the CLASS program, the CLASS Act, is truly sustainable before the administration proceeds with program operations? Yes, sir, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. And the last thing that I wanted to uh, uh, address with you, uh, and this is kind of a follow-on to uh, Chairman uh, Dingell's line of question earlier uh, regarding H.R. 1. And he asked you a number of uh, yes or no uh, questions, and I think you responded pretty much to every one of them, uh, yes, uh, that H.R. Uh, 1 and the $61 billion worth of cuts would hurt this program and that program and the other program. Uh, do you believe that we need to restore fiscal sanity to our budget, yes or no? Yes, sir. Do you believe then that the $61 billion in discretionary cuts in the CR for fiscal year 2011 contained in H.R. 1 will help the federal government reduce its current budgetary deficit, yes or no? Sir, I believe that the president has put a very responsible budget forward, and it's one that... Not talking about 2012 now, Madam Secretary. I'm talking about H.R. 1, the CR, and the $61 billion worth of cuts that Chairman, former Chairman Dingell was uh, attacking. I support the president's notion that we have to make smart and strategic cuts. So, so the answer, the answer is yes. I thank you, Madam Secretary. And, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my 13 seconds. I Chair, don't thanks, think the gentlemen. answer was yes, but... The gentleman's time has expired, uh, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Weiner, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. W welcome. As to this notion that we didn't invite you to come testify last year after the passage of the bill, having heard these questions, all I have to say to you is you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I just wanted probably no, no member of the government, maybe even in history, has had to spend so much of her time swatting away lies. 
So let me kind of run through some things maybe we can cover in a four minutes and 33 seconds to try to get some truth on some of the big questions of the day. First of all, this notion that if you give people a subsidy and an incentive to purchase health insurance, somehow that they're not going to want it, that this individual mandate is somehow this huge burden. Um, you might not be aware of this, but I will tell you the number of people in Romney Care in Massachusetts, which also had a mandate, that chose not to sign up after they got the subsidy, chose instead to pay for the penalty or the tax, whatever we're going to call it, was 0.65 percent. Meaning that when you offer people the incentive to get insurance for their families to get better health care and a better life, they take it. So the idea that this mandate, if it disappears, will somehow have a dramatic impact, maybe 1 percent of people would be impacted. But just so we understand and you can clear it up for us, the reason there is a requirement that people get insurance when offered a subsidy and incentives to get it, it is because if they don't get it and they're uninsured, when they need hospital care or health care costs, they pass it along to the rest of society. Is that That's right? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. The second thing is we've heard a lot of the, uh, in the repeal efforts, this being called a job-killing bill. If we repeal the health care bill, would the subsidies going to small businesses, the tax credits, to provide health care for their workers, making those workers less expensive, would those subsidies disappear if we repeal the bill? Yes, sir. Thank you. Next is this notion about Medicaid providing this enormous unfunded liability in the out years. Is it not true that under the bill, any additional people covered under Medicaid, which are poor people, but they're not going to be as poor under the new bill since we're going to raise the, the, the limit a bit, not to a lot, it's still, you have to have a $30,000 family income for a family of four, it's not a lot of money, that the, it provides no additional cost at all to the states until at least, at least the year 2017. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the year 2018, when there is a marginal difference, if the number of poor people in the states goes down, meaning the economy has improved, meaning fewer people are poor enough to be eligible for Medicaid, more people are working, those costs could go down as well if there are fewer people on Medicaid. Could there not? That's correct. And I assume that all of us believe and we hope that the economy is going to keep getting better. We've had Republican governors here saying, my costs are going to go through the roof. Well, they only go through a roof if you're a crummy governor. And your, and your poverty in your state continues to go up. Is that correct? Well, you, oh, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never Thank mind. You. you can leave out the crummy governor part. That's me editorializing. <laughs> Finally, another thing my Republican friends have said again and again is this is a trampling of states' rights, that the most powerful secretary is taking more and more control. I'm going to give you a couple of things here. First of all, is it not true that the exchanges are going to be run by the states? If they choose to do so, If absolutely. they choose to do so. Is it not true that the tort laws, which are now states by states, there was a decision made in this law by the people who wrote the law not to trample on states' rights with tort laws, that now the 50 states still have their tort law laws in effect. Is that That's correct? correct? Is it also not true that state insurance commissioners and commissions and the state governance of insurance was left intact? At the state level, with additional resources for those Correct. States. We actually empowered them. They now have the ability Correct. to do things to hold down rates. Before. So much for this notion of we're centralizing power in your office or centralizing the federal government. We went in an opposite direction. We did not go the direction I would have liked of expanding Medicare, which is a much better idea, by the way, Madam Secretary, expanding Medicare little by little. We went a different way. And one final point on this notion of expanding the office, your power of your office. These 1115 waivers that you've been given are an effort, each one is you saying we are going to be flexible to allow to respond to your ex expression of what's going on in the states and the marketplace at the business, so long as we get to the outcome we all aspire to, which is more people getting affordable coverage, reducing the cost to people along the way. Isn't it the, the waivers makes the point that this is not this intractable, inflexible, centralized monolith that it is a conversation that's going on between states and businesses in your office to try to make sure we get the outcomes we all want. I think the bill recognizes the framework that states know their markets best. They are the laboratories of innovation. They but and those waivers are an expression of that Absolutely. as well, are they not? Okay, in five minutes, we did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lies told by the Republicans. Imagine if we had more time, but we don't. Thank you, Madam. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognized the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, I'm gonna, I'd like to change track just a little bit. And uh, in reading your testimony, 
On page 8, under the Advance of the Health, Safety, and Well-Being of the American People, it says, Child Support and the fa Fatherhood Initiative. And the two sentences I'm interested in. The budget includes $305 million in fiscal year 2012 and $2.4 billion over 10 years for the Child Support and Fatherhood Initiative. This initiative is designed uh, to promote strong family relationships by encouraging fathers to take responsibility for their children, changing policies so that more of the father's uh, father support reaches their children, continuing a commitment to vigorous enforcement. I guess my first question, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, is we're, we're st we're, you, it states here that we're going to encourage fathers to take responsibility for their children. What encouragement are we uh, are going to be offering them? I think it, it Congressman, it refers to um, working with states on a, um, a more effective and vigorous enforcement of child support orders and seeking child support orders from the outset and making sure that there is a financial um, connection between fathers and the children that they have born. Okay, let me, let me follow up with that. Um, and the reason I, this really uh, caught my attention because several lifetimes ago, I was in the Ohio Senate, I chaired the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee and we had a large bill that I, had, uh, that I sponsored in dealing on uh, especially juveniles and juvenile crime, et cetera. And one of the judges that appeared before us uh, during about, uh, I think it was like 18 or 19 hearings on that piece of legislation, that as we were going through it and we were talking about parents, it really came down to the, and I think this one judge really caught the essence of the entire day. He said it was really, an, what we're looking at is an abdication of parental responsibility. And I guess the next question would be then is that, do we have any current uh, programs, models that we can base the belief or successes that this is gonna work with? I, I'm sorry, sir. Do we have do we have any current programs or any other models out there that's going to sh uh, you know if we're going to spend 305 to 2.4 billion over 10 years, do we have anything out there that's going to show that this is going to work? Well, we have. I think um, this is part of the TANF umbrella, and I I do think we have data that indicates there are strategies that are more effective than others, and what we're trying to do is improve this effort along the way to make sure that. Um, child support is not only um, effectively administered, but that more of these dollars will actually go to the children and not be siphoned off along the way. So it's a, it's a double um, improvement. Okay, and I guess the, uh, you know, it really comes down to, you know, can, you know, can government really change uh, some of these folks out there the way that they're, they're parent, uh, I guess you'd say, non-parenting right now? <coughs> Well, I'm, if I could just and I interpose this too, and even going back in a farther lifetime, when we used to have what they called Bureau of Support, and I remember when I was uh, working in the prosecutor's office many moon ago, I asked one gentleman uh, if he wanted to go to jail for not paying his support. He said, I don't care. Well, and unfortunately, are, I, w I wish there was a law that you could pass that yeah. um, would, would do just what you're suggesting. But at a minimum, I think that um, what we can do is be effective in terms of um, trying to make sure that children are not penalized financially uh, by a father who would walk away. But uh, I think this also includes fatherhood engagement um, increases and increased access and visitation. Often those two things are tied together. If a father is really prohibited from uh, connecting with his children, he is less likely to be a financial provider. And so I think it looks at the whole, the overall uh, package of the family. And if I could just, uh, uh, my last uh, minute here, uh, going back to a question that uh, has come up, uh, I know from uh, Mr. Pallone, the question of, it's in the uh, page three, the budget limited subsidies to children's hospitals, graduate medical education. And it says, tar and, and focusing instead on targeting those investments to increase the primary care workforce. I know a lot of the times when people are coming in from children's hospitals from Ohio that I'm meeting with, they say that they're the stepchildren that they're not getting the dollars. They're not getting the dollars from NIH. What, what are we targeting then in, the, in your testimony? This is instead targeted investments to increase primary care workforce. Well, the, again, I don't think this is, a, is an easy cut to put on the table, and I can guarantee you that in a budget that we had full resources, this would not be um, a preferred cut. The, GME dollars are being redirected to 
um, I think, programs that have as a exclusive focus the, the sort of primary care provider network, recognizing that we're going to um, need additional primary care docs uh, looking forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gentlemen. Chairman. My time has expired, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Secretary, I want to thank you so much for being here today. We've asked you to lead an historic effort, and I can't think of anyone uh, better able to do that given your experience as an insurance industry regulator and as a governor. So clearly you have the uh, uh, mindset of governors as you go about your business. We've asked you to rein in an out-of-control private insurance industry that on a daily basis denies coverage and benefits to healthcare consumers. I'm interested that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem more interested in arranging your office structure than in rooting out those abuses. And I'm interested that they have attacked the size of the new Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. By my calculation, the 272 positions that you've requested to staff CCHO is the equivalent of about 16 house offices. I know our staffs work very hard, just as your staff does, but I don't think that that's an enormous number of people when we have tasked them with setting up the new standards and structures created under the Affordable Care Act. Um, let, me, let me also say that, um, you know, we, we heard from um, the other side of the aisle this notion that all that Americans really want is for government to get out of the way when it comes to their health care. That is really not my impression in the, the least. Uh, we certainly don't need more evidence than the popularity of Medicare, the importance of Medicaid, leaving the Affordable Care Act uh, aside. But is it, is it your sense that what the American people want um, is to reject help from the government to cover their health care? Well, as you said, Congressman, to assure I think their Medicare coverage. is enormously popular, and um, I think the probably the second most popular insurance program um, may be the Children's Health Insurance Program, both of which uh, are government-based programs delivering vital services to millions and millions of Americans. And I think it's just important to say over and over again that far from being a government takeover of health care, that the Affordable Care Act, though some of us felt perhaps it shouldn't be this way, relies entirely on the, uh, the, the, the private insurance companies um, with some help from the government, but this is um, a private sector-based uh, plan, plan that we do. Uh, that, that we're, we're doing. So let me ask a few questions on behalf of, of, of my constituents. If you were denied funding to implement the Affordable Health Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, will health insurance purchasers know that at least 80% of their premium dollars will be spent on medical care purchasers? Will we, will we have any guarantee that that will happen? It would be very difficult to implement the medical loss ratio, as you described. In, in states like Illinois, without any rate approval requirements, then, um, how would rates that are out of line even be enforced? Well, again, I think it would be um, one of the requirements is that um, we help to identify excessive rates and at least post them so consumers have some way of um, judging, but that would not be available to consumers. Well, with the Affordable Care Act, yes, I think we would get some help in, in right. Illinois. But without it, we are simply That's totally at the mercy of the, uh, of the insurance companies. Um, what does it mean for seniors and people with disabilities who are counting on the phase out of the donut hole if the Affordable Care Act were ultimately repealed? Well, clearly those um, additional benefits to seniors, which include, as you know, uh, annual wellness visit, a um, elimination of co-pays for preventive 
screenings and health, and as, as you say, a, a gradual elimination of the donut holes starting this year with a 50% discount, that would cease to be uh, a Medicare benefit. All of those things just, just disappear. Um, l let me quickly say, I'm wondering, because process has been attacked, can you tell us briefly the process through which HHS adopted the, uh, the, the, the rules that um, deal with the 80% min uh, lo loss ratio? Well, um, Congresswoman, we were directed and followed this very carefully, working with the nation's insurance commissioners to um, ask for their input and advice on the outline of a medical loss ratio, what portion um, should, uh, what elements should be included in the medical portion of the 80% and what should be outside that. They made a unanimous recommendation to our office uh, this fall. We adopted 100% of what they um, recommended to us and that is the rule. So this is not an HHS rule uh, in so far as uh, we did not design it. The nation's 50 insurance commissioners made the recommendation which we adopted. The gentlelady's time has expired and the chair recognized the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you, Madam Secretary. I'm new to the committee and I look forward to working with you on uh, issues of mutual concern. Um, I have the honor of representing a district that uh, is arguably the medicine chest of the nation, and I would like to think of the entire world. And regarding the President's uh, proposed budget, there is a suggestion that the data exclusivity be reduced from 12 years uh, to seven years. Uh, I, I personally oppose that, and I do not think it is in the best interest of the nation's health. Um, there has been extensive economic modeling on this uh, at Duke University, and um, the modeling indicates that there is a range of between 12 and 16 years as the time needed to allow an innovator in uh, biopharma to recoup the amount spent in order to bring uh, to market uh, needed uh, medicines in this regard. And Madam Secretary, I, I would like your comments regarding the suggested reduction in the, in the fiscal year 2012 budget on data exclusivity from 12 to seven years. Congressman, I think there is a, um, a great importance in making sure that we continue to accelerate um, our leading position in breakthrough science, and certainly your state is renowned for um, uh, being a great leader Thank in that. Um, I think the balance, as um, you recognize, is, is not only making sure that companies can recoup their investment and are profitable, because uh, if they're not profitable, they're not going to continue research, but that as quickly as possible, once that um, determination has been made, that breakthrough medication is also widely available and affordable uh, to the population. And that's a tension that I think continues to exist. Um, the President uh, believes that uh, based on uh, a whole information, and I know there are competing experts on how long yes. and how much evergreening should go beyond the patent protection, um, that seven years would indeed accomplish the goals of both returning the profit and uh, continuing the research, but also making the medication widely available. Thank you for your uh, response. Um, um, the last time this committee uh, uh, examined this issue in an overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion, the, the committee chose to retain the 12 years, and I look forward to continuing discussions with, with your department on, on this matter. Uh, secondly, Madam Speaker, um, regarding uh, uh, PDUFA, um, uh, there, there is the challenge now with its reauthorization, and um, at the most recent reauthorization, there was uh, included uh, uh, the REMS, the risk management and mitigation strategies, and at least in some instances, it's, it's my judgment that uh, this has been a challenge. Uh, for example, Johnson & Johnson had a, a product on the market for over 20 years and was required to submit a REMS that took over 22 months to resolve. Um, 
your comments, Madam Secretary, regarding this as we go about reauthorizing PDUFA over the next year? Well, again, I think it's an area where um, we are mindful of um, time delays uh, on behalf of not only um, companies, but certainly consumers. Uh, at the same time, I think mindful of the very important safety efforts, and I look forward to working with you on that, ba striking the right balance. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate uh, uh, your, your comments in both of these important areas that, that I, I think uh, go to the heart that we have to work together in these areas as we uh, make sure that the nation's health is protected and that we remain uh, the medicine chest of the entire world. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, Chair thanks, gentlemen, and uh, Recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, for five minutes for questions. Um, hey, Mr. Madam Secretary, I'm not so hurried now. Yeah, he's not a member. Um, first, I want to thank Mr. Pallone because apparently he's committed to working on equity for uh, FMAP payments, or at least a federal support of care for the poor. And I will submit two uh, articles for the record with, uh, with unanimous consent, one from the GAO, one from AEI, talking about the current inequity in that situation. Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Secondly, um, Madam Secretary, I've got young children, so what I'm about to say just strikes me. Um, sometimes it seems like opposite day. Uh, so here we have a report from Chairman Bernanke saying that Medicaid, among other entitlements, are driving long-term deficit spending. You, in your opening remarks, mention how we, the administration is concerned regarding the deficit. And yet, when I look at all the literature given, I see that here, according to CBO, federal spending on Medicaid will increase by $674 billion over the next 10 years. I see from CMS actuaries that federal, that state spending will go up by $190 billion, and if you include the latest estimate from CBO, that's probably more like $250 billion over the next 10 years. Now, clearly you're concerned about it. I have a copy of your letter which suggests to governors the ways that they can do it. For example, you suggest they could eliminate optional benefits like pharmacy coverage, and Massachusetts doing that sort of thing because as their budget chairman says their current Medicaid growth is unsustainable. Uh, Mr. Engel, I'm sorry he's left, but I've got a Deloitte report, which I'll submit for the record, that estimates that under PPACA, 50% of New York's state budget may go to Medicaid by 2030. Now, with all this said, first, it does seem like opposite day. It does seem as if there's concern for the deficit, and yet we're driving the deficit with this bill. And secondly, regarding maintenance of effort, you mentioned your hands were kind of tied, if you will. Would you commit to working with Congress, with us, to help the governors with this maintenance of effort so that they don't have to necessarily slash dental benefits in Massachusetts or something else in New York? I ask your thoughts. Well, Congressman, I, I share your concerns about the health care costs uh, driving the deficit, and I don't think there's any question that it's the number one cost driver. I would suggest that... Um, what we have to do, and I'm convinced we have a new platform to work on this, is actually um, also look at the underlying cost drivers with which rather, um, whether you're talking about the public programs, Medicare or Medicaid, or the private sector trying to provide health care, we have a trajectory on health care costs that's simply unsustainable. Can I, can I just because I have limited time, and I want your thoughts. Massachusetts, as the governor said, is certainly the harbinger of how things are going to come. I see over the last 10 years their state budget going towards health care expenses has gone from 21 percent to 37 percent. That's why they're now slashing benefits. So it seems like if this is going to control costs, when does it begin? Well, I think that the Massachusetts program is a great example, and I think it's a great example of what is possible on the exchange side and with coverage, which Congressman Wiener mentioned, but it also had a missing component. Um, Governor Romney and certainly Governor Patrick would be the first to tell you that when Massachusetts designed their program, they focused on access and not on cost containment. Now, if I can, and if they are revisiting I, the cost I'm with you on that. Things. And when I look at what they, and I I'm just know, and I have limited time, when I look at what they're proposing, none of which has been proven to control cost. It's all theoretical, but it's not actually been proven. I think the governor at one point proposed provider fee, freezing provider fees, and that was thrown out by a judge. 
So it really seems as if the cost control mechanisms, which again is similarly in PUPACA, have not been established to control cost. Well, I think the Affordable Care Act has as an underlying premise and a huge number of um, underlying cost control, both delivery system changes, but I think more importantly, and unfortunately the Congressional Budget Office hasn't scored this, but um, the effort to look at the drivers of chronic disease, which uh, is where we spend about 75 cents of every health dollar, obesity and smoking can have the most enormous I wish I had five more your, minutes. Uh, Let me interrupt. Children's health care. Let me ask one more thing because I'm out of time. You mentioned that the Class Act, you're kind of uh, concerned about it. It's $75 billion scored by CBO towards the uh, credit side of PPACA. On the other hand, you mentioned that it's unsustainable. It seems a little disingenuous for something which really long term is not sustainable to then claim it as a kind of credit in terms of proving the cost worthiness of a bill. The deficit commission um, recommendation were that we either should look at repealing the class act or reforming it. And we have the flexibility administratively to do the latter. That's exactly what we intend to do. And I look forward to visiting with this committee as I pledge to do to tell you the outlines of what we think will be a sustainable program. And could I ask you, I, one question I asked at the beginning, would you pledge to work with us on helping the states on a bipartisan basis with their maintenance of effort? We're in the process of doing that right now. Yes. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I think I may be the last one on the panel, so hopefully um, moving forward. Uh, uh, one thing that, that Mr. Weiner brought up, um, if you expand Medicaid to 100 to 133 percent, you're going to bring on children and, and p the parents, but you're also going to bring on the disabled and the elderly. Uh, in, in big proportion. So, and if the economy does grow, as, as governors are looking, if, if we think you can just grow out of it, the most expensive people who participate in Medicaid are the disabled and elderly. So, which are more, not, not as elastic to, to getting jobs if the economy moves forward, they're still going to be with us. So, the fact that we can just grow out of this is not really necessarily the thing. I just want to make that point. And when, when, you, when you made your op opening remarks, you listed a lot of the things that, that people have been listing that people like about the Health Care Act, uh, pre-existing conditions for children, 26-year-olds, you can stay on. And you also said, and I think I quote, businesses are getting relief. They're also businesses are getting relief from rising health care costs. And I can tell you from businesses I know that because of the new benefits that are mandated, premiums are rising as they've, they've already started rising. So I just, the evidence that business costs are decreasing, I have, we haven't seen that. If, hopefully you have. And I can share it with businesses and see what they need to do differently. Well, short term, um, Congressman, as you know, small business owners are eligible for a tax credit, which helps provide some relief to the costs of covering their employees. And what I hear from small business owners across the country is that's often their biggest bottom line cost and the way they lose their best employees to their larger competitors. So that provides some short-term relief. Long-term relief comes in 2014 with a new market where they will finally have the leverage buying power that their large competitors have. Businesses on average, small business owners, spend about 25% more on exactly the same coverage as does someone with market power. And in 2014, those rates, and again, CBO and other actuaries have said those rates will come down fairly dramatically. But, but medium-sized businesses are seeing, I know, business with 400 employees, and they've seen an increase because of the new mandated benefits. I mean, that's moving forward, already reflected. Because you can, you can increase benefits. If you're going to increase benefits, you're also going to, there's a cost to that. And it's reflected in the premium businesses are paying. Well, again, the, the actuarial reports that I have seen indicate that there is a um, relatively insignificant uh, impact at this point on the kinds of uh, benefits going forward. And as you know, we are trying to, uh, the, the waiver program that uh, has been mentioned a number of times, which dealt with one feature of the bill, the annual limit, um, was designed to try and insulate businesses in the short term from the kind of rate shock that they may see. So we're, we're in a balancing act getting between now and 2014. Yeah, we did to so be mindful. Obviously, businesses plan for their long-term success, too. And, I, and I, I don't, I, I, you understand that. I know we need to work together. I had a couple of physicians, one that wanted about a minute. Can I give you a minute and him a minute? Yield a minute to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, 
again, thank you for being here. And now that you know where we are, don't make yourself so scarce. Um, going back to 4101 A and B for just a moment, the mandatory funding for the construction of the clinics, the discretionary funding for the staffing of the clinics, um, there was no request in the budget for the discretionary money for the funding of the clinics. So are we likely to be left with a situation where we are required to build them under mandatory funding, but no one to staff them under discretionary funding? These are the school clinics under 4101A and B. Congressman, all I can tell you is the budget does include in the Health Resources and Services Administration um, a request for increased uh, funding uh, with regard to community health centers for the workforce for um, new nothing. National Health Service Corps providers and new primary care providers. Specifically the school-based clinics. But I, those are part of the... Maybe you could get that answer back to me in writing. I yeah, yield back fine. to the gentleman from Kentucky. I want to yield the remainder to the gentleman from Louisiana. Just one more question, <laughs> Madam Secretary. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> to follow up on uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky's, since it's my understanding that we're raising Medicare premiums to, to close that donut hole, what would the seniors do if they were able to keep their own money as opposed to closing the donut hole? And of course, I'm sorry, it's we're raising Medicare premiums. Um, it's my understanding Medicare Part D premiums are going up to close that donut hole. Is that not true? No, sir, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, well, then I'll follow up with that at a later Okay. Point. Thank you. I yield back. Do you yield to me? Yeah. I yield to the gentleman from Texas. We haven't yet talked about the sustainable growth rate formula, and that was one of the big omissions from PIPACA. Uh, all of the money taken out of Medicare and not a single dime for a down payment for buying us out of the, the SGR reductions. What are your plans for getting us out of the SGR? Well, as you know, Congressman, the um, SGR dates back to 2002 and has um, been an issue that um, has not been effectively dealt with. This president, since his um, first budget, has recommended uh, a long-term fix. He has proposed in this year's budget not only um, working with Congress for a 10-year resolution, but also put more than two years of funding into the budget. So we would look forward to working with this committee to find a long-term fix. I agree with you. It's probably the single most threatening issue to Medicare beneficiaries uh, on the horizon. The gentleman's time has expired. <clears throat> Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Sabellas, thank you so much for uh, testifying before the committee, subcommittee. I know your time is valuable, and so I will be brief with you know, my questions. Uh, first, I should note that I am pleased to see the direction that the administration has taken on the budget request. I am concerned that should the cuts proposed by HR1 pass, HHS would not be able to deliver on key services and programs that benefit the public. Um, let me, um, one area that I'm very concerned about uh, is the community health centers. They provide an extremely valuable service in my district. As I imagine they do for many members on both sides of the aisle, even though some might not admit it. Uh, I understand that the proposed cuts in HR 1 would have a devastating impact on community health centers, possibly closing up to 127 health centers and cutting off 11 million patients over the next year. In contrast, how has the HHS budget request dealt with these very valuable centers? Well, Congressman, I share your um appreciation for the critical services that health centers provide in um, our most underserved areas. And uh, between the investment of the Recovery Act, the President's budgets, and the Affordable Care Act, uh, the goal is to really double the number of Americans who have access to those vital, um, high quality, lower cost, preventive services. And uh, the President has made um, a budget request for an increased support for community health centers, including for providers who serve in, that, in those centers, training 15,000 new providers over the course of the next five years, and having those 
folks available. Um, absent that expanded footprint, we will have uh, far more people um, accessing health care in the least expense, I mean, the most expensive, least effective way through the doors of emergency rooms are just not getting the health care at all. Right. Let me say, I was watching TV, you know, from in the hearings here, and I saw a member raising a, 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 a booklet saying that this is why, you know, you're in the minority. And, you know, I, I hope that, you know, you're not affected by that in any way because, you know, sometimes, you know, it takes some people a little longer to figure out what's going on. And I think that uh, we need to just, you know, move forward because I think that there's no question in my mind uh, that this is going to save a lot of lives and eventually we're going to save a lot of money. There's no question about it. So uh, I'm hoping that, you know, you don't let this deter you in any way. You continue to move forward. Let that encourage you because, let's face it, eventually they'll get the message as well. So I want to thank you very, very much for the work that you're doing, and we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, work with you. I think the only thing I would hope that we would be able to put together some more private and public partnerships, maybe even around the community health centers, to see in terms of what we might be able to do to sort of keep them open, because they provide a, such a valuable service in many, many neighborhoods. Well, Congressman, every place I go, I try to visit the community health center that's closest, and I have um, seen some extraordinary providers across this country who not only are uh, providing life-saving medical care, but incredible family support. And I don't disagree that it is uh, proven over and over again to be not only very high-quality care, but at a far lower cost than any variety of options. So I would look forward to working with you to make sure that this incredibly important public support uh, stays in place. Right. Thank you very much. And on that note, I yield back. Uh, Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, is recognized five minutes for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Sebelius. Thank you for being with us today. Um, one comment that I just wanted to make uh, which probably didn't have to be made, but I'm sure you've uh, felt a lot of animosity, even a lot of frustration over this whole health care bill, as many in America have felt. And one of the reasons that people have felt that way is that they brought a 2,400-page bill to the House floor last year, and we were not able to offer one amendment on the House floor. And I don't think the American people appreciate bills of that magnitude having the impact on this country and the legislative body not being able to offer one amendment on the House floor. Certainly not your fault. You, you were not the speaker. But from that background and, and because of that process, there's still very strong feelings about the issue. But one, one of the questions I would just like to ask you, many members of Congress, to be honest, did not have much of an idea of what was even in the bill when we voted on it. And as Secretary of HHS, I'm assumed that in the process of developing the bill, you must have at least been consulted. You were hopefully able to suggest ideas and have some input into the process. Uh, so my first question would be, did, did you have an opportunity to have input into the process? Yes, Congressman, I did. And as you know, there were five committees, three in the House and two in the Senate. There were No, I know that now. Hearings. Just a minute. And yes, I we, did. We, we, in fact, we adopted eight amendments in the Energy and Commerce Committee. All of them were stripped out before it went to the floor. And Democrats and Republicans adopted those amendments. They all were stripped out. And we were not offered, able to offer one amendment on the floor. But here's the question I have. We know that there's going to be about... 20 million more people on the Medicaid program, according to all of the numbers that we've seen uh, by the year 2014 or whatever. And every governor that I talk to, both Democrat and Republican, say that one of the reasons they're having financial difficulty in these states, not the only reason, but one, 
is the fact of the cost of the Medicaid program. Now, the states are having great financial difficulty. The federal government goes without saying, we have a $14 trillion federal debt. How was it concluded that the federal government would pick up 100% of the cost of those additional 20 million people on Medicaid? Now, I've heard some comment, well, the states are not going to be hit with this additional cost. Well, the reason they're not going to be hit with it is because the federal government is. So my question would be, how was it determined that the federal government should do that when we are in worse shape at the federal level than some of the states are at the state level? Well, Congressman, I think it was seen as a way to um, have a partnership going forward and for the first time ever have a benefit level that regardless of where you lived in this country, you were eligible for uh, health insurance so that uh, uniformly now across the country at families at 133 percent of poverty or less would qualify. And for that additional population, some states are well above that right now. Some states are well below it. But for the additional population, at least for the first three years, it was seen that the federal government should pick up the lion's share and well, then gradually I mean, I, the state would participate. Well, I, I mean, if I had been there, I think I would have disagreed with that. But nevertheless, that's what it is. But the thing that really bothers me, when you talk to primary care physicians today, they're already upset about the low reimbursement rates for Medicaid patients. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. We have two doctors here and maybe some over there. Most of the primary care physicians I talk to say, we're not going to take any more Medicaid patients. So if you put a 20 million more people on there, they're going to go right back to the emergency room. Well, I'd, at least the doctors who I talk to across the country, and I do visit with a lot of them, I, are not happy with the uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates. But the vast majority of people we're talking about have no reimbursement rates, are not seeing a doctor, are using the health care system in a very inefficient way. Uh, I think one of the reasons that, again, the Affordable Care Act suggests that um, Medicaid doctors for at least the first several years will be paid at Medicare rates is a recognition that the Medicaid rates across the country are insufficiently low. And that is, again, part of the Affordable Care Act structure. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we have one other member who's not a member of the subcommittee, he's a member of the full committee, he's waited patiently all hearing. I know our time's passed. Would you uh, stay for yes. five minutes? Thank you. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy. Let me wave on. This is my first term on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I haven't been on the Health Subcommittee, and so I appreciate the chance to, to be here. Uh, welcome, Madam Secretary. and. Uh, uh, I just want to remind folks the Medicaid reimbursement rates are set by the states. That's correct. And we had three governors here yesterday or a couple of days ago with our oversight and investigation, and they wanted more flexibility. And they have elect a lot of flexibility now in reimbursement rates. And uh, there's some decisions can be made because, and I think we're right, we understand that doctors, uh, Medicaid pays less than Medicare. Frankly, in my part of the country, TRICARE pays less than Medicare. So, you know, although in Houston area where I'm from, we don't have a big base, so a lot of physicians won't take TRICARE because it's so, but, but that's a state issue. Uh, we don't, definitely don't want the state, federal government to set Medicaid rates because we'd have more governors up here complaining. But uh, the other issue I want to ask is on the health care reform bill, uh, the impact on the teaching health centers, uh, our medical schools and that are associated. What is the impact that you're seeing on, on our teaching health centers? Because we're fortunate, at least in the Houston area, to have three that serve our metropolitan area. And my goal is to encourage them to get out to our community-based health centers and partner with them, because that way I also want those uh, residents to understand they can make a good living in a community-based health center. Well, recently I had the chance to visit again with the um, head of the Association of Academic Health Centers, and um, he joined a group of providers uh, talking about what he sees as a, um, an enormously important opportunity to begin to transform healthcare delivery with the Affordable Care Act, that the um, uh, patient-centered, provider-centered opportunities with uh, the kind of payment models that 
uh, are part of the Affordable Care Act, everything from primary medical home models, which actually reimburse physicians for keeping their patients healthy in the first place, and you don't have to wait till they go to the hospital to get paid, uh, to bundling care, to using the most innovative strategies they see as a wonderful opportunity. And as you say, in many areas already, there is a lot of discussion with uh, academic health centers and um, community health centers about becoming accountable care organizations and combining those strategies uh, to deliver better care to more people. Okay. I know that the HR1 cut or proposed to cut $1.3 billion from the health centers program. And I understand the Health Centers uh, Services Resource Administration has announced its intention to award ac new access points, new health centers, and new sites of existing centers. And as you know, this funding opportunity to facilitate health centers expansion made possible by provisions in the health reform law and the President's request. And frankly, I worked with the administration under President Bush many times to expand health uh, centers funding. Can you tell us how many applications for new health centers HRSA has received and how many awards HRSA intends to fund and how many of the awards would HRSA make if HR1 was enacted if 1.3 billion were cut? I know that may not be possible now. Uh, Congressman, I'd love to get you those specifics okay. in, in writing, but suffice it to say that loss of the investment in um, anticipated would severely curtail this program. You have better information than I do, but we understood that there were about 800 applications for 350 possible awards. But again, you have the exact numbers. That's what we've heard. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know I have a one a little bit left. It's well documented health centers provide high cost effective and high quality patient directed care and reduces overall cost in the health care system. Can you describe the overarching impact of the health care system and the continued health care expansion outlined in the President's uh, FY12 budget request? Well, I think, um, Congressman, the, the anticipation is that um, we would be able to gradually move from serving 20 million uh, Americans to 40 million Americans. And as you know, the Health Services Resources Administration maps pretty carefully where is the underserved need, where are the access points that need to be filled. Some are in very rural areas, some are in very urban areas. And uh, that expansion has provided enormously important care to uh, families across this country. Thank you, and I appreciate it. I know I'm almost out of time, but in the Houston area, we got we started on community health centers much later in most parts of the country. So we're considered, I think, an under underserved area. But uh, you putting but in also, a pitch. Uh, the community health centers are not refusing Medicaid patients. So that's if correct. doctors cannot afford in their practice to take them, that's why we need expansion of community Some are uninsured, some are uh, Medicaid, but a number of people are fully insured and choose a community health center as their health home. And sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Inspired. In conclusion, I would like to thank Secretary Sebelius and the members for participating in today's hearing. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask Secretary Sebelius to respond promptly to the questions. Thank you, Members Mr. should submit their questions by the close of business on March 17. Mr. Chairman, will you yield for a moment for a unanimous consent request? Yes. I have a unanimous consent to add the letter that I wrote to Secretary Sebelius on February 10th to the record. Without objection, it will be entered into the record. Thank you. If there's nothing further before the committee, this subcommittee hearing is adjourned.
This weekend on American History TV on C-SPAN 3, live from the U.S. Capitol, the 150th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address and his oath.